Hello, it is hey, George, hey there. and this is Bait and Warlord. Lord. Yes, and uh, two and a half years ago, you know, time is imaginary during the pandemic, so really, like yesterday. Basic, yeah, basically 15 minutes ago. Basically. Um, Baylor, Terrence, and I had a two-week period or something. It might have even been one and a half. It was very close together, where all three of us broke 10 wins in a row rotating on Ascension 20 with Heart for Slay the Spire at like the same time, basically. Slay the Spire hasn't been out that long, but like that was basically the same exact moment in the history of the game. All three of us did it at the same time, which was really, really cool. And I had Baylor and Terrence on, and we all talked about our streaks, and it was a good time. And then stuff sort of mellowed out for a while. Um, the 13-0 win streak that Terrence set, I eventually managed to equal it, but like nobody extended that for another year and a half plus. And then this year there's been some movement <laughs> and um, I got like a 15-0 and a 16-0 and a 17-0. And then like two weeks after my 17-0, Baylor got a 20-0. So we have, now, we have now broken 20. 20 barriers done. And also Baylor and I still like, I don't know, our brains are just aligned. There's something about the weather or something. Like we just decide to both win lots of runs of Slay the Spire in a row at the same time sometimes. It, it's, it's quite a, a confluence of factors. Um, yeah. the, it, it seems like people in the community are, are inspired or get spurts of luck kind of at the same time. I do uh, always like I said, this happened wonder. back in 2020 with the, the three-way tie. And I'd even say it happened before back with the Ascension 15 win streaks. You originally set a, a score of 25. And uh, I don't I even remember that. that. Yeah, that was a long <laughs> time ago. I, I ended up topping that a little bit, and then Ascension 20 came out, and we started all over again. Hmm. Uh, here's a question for you. When, when Ascension 20 and the Heart first released, did you ever think that the game would see 20 consecutive wins under those conditions? Oh my gosh. Well, it hasn't under those conditions. That's, <laughs> there, that's true. There yes. have been quite a few yeah. buffs since then to the Lizard player. Lizard Tail is a boss relic, and I'll die on that hill. Did the specimen used to be a boss relic? Somebody's... Yes, tragically. There are things that I just don't even believe. Like, I guess I lived through them, but people will remind me that they are true, and I'll be like, no. Legends specimen couldn't be a boss relic. Of a um, relic called runic dodecahedron. I can tell you that the first time anyone got 10 in a row rotating was Crimson Blur, and then the three of us extended above that 10 in a row. Um, and when he did it, I didn't think that that was the end. I, I was very confident that we'd go above. And currently, I don't think that this is the end. I'm very confident that we'll continue no, I'm, to improve. I'm, I'm quite confident someone, whether it's you, me, or somebody else in the community, will break the 20 mark again and set a new record eventually. Yeah, maybe not this year, but I, I would be surprised if it didn't happen next year. We're just getting better at the game. Um, at the time, though, when the heart came out... Um, it was like very hard at that time to win two runs in a row, I feel like. Yeah. So I was I was definitely not thinking about winning twenty at that time. And I'd won twenty before. I'd I'd won over twenty on silent on Ascension fifteen, and apparently I'd won over twenty rotating on Ascension fifteen. You're telling me. I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah, twenty <laughs> twenty five was the number I remember. Okay. Well I, I will believe you. <laughs> you take my word for it. <laughs> um so yeah, I mean, I knew what it felt like to win that many times in a row, and I knew how comfortable I expected to be in a run going through a run like that. And at that time when the heart was out, that was a massive change because Ascension 20 was very recent as well. So the idea of fighting two bosses and then an Act 4 Elite fight, which is as hard as the bosses, basically, it's harder for some decks. And then the heart itself, like, that is four times as many bosses. <laughs> That's drastically changed how we had to think about building decks and how important the late game was versus the early game and things like that. Absolutely. It, it's funny. To this day, I really don't think about those two bosses in a row, the Act 3 boss gauntlet, all that much. They seem to be in this weird space where all the other things that I'm preoccupied with right. solving end up incidentally addressing them. Mostly. Exactly. I remember... With, with when it started, though, 
like I used to play act threes where I dodged elites and saved the right potions for the boss I could see I was fighting oh, and my yeah. deck didn't have to be anywhere near as strong. But when there's another boss afterwards, so your potions can't just carry you through and you don't even know which one it is, all of a sudden you have to make a much stronger deck in there. But yeah, now that like the hearts in the game, most of the act three bosses are incidental for most decks. For sure. Definitely. Act Act four changed the decision making a lot. I I definitely remember the the very early games of Spire. I was stoked to get to the end of Act three with a, a strength potion and a dexterity potion. Like, oh, oh yeah, I got my scaling for the boss. That's, that's enough I'm for Donu Daka or Donu Daka. <laughs> um, so my first question before we actually look at the runs is how 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 what would you identify as being the Catalyst for improving to a level where you can win 20 runs in a row, at least one time, and maybe another. Um, and how do you see yourself improving further to do even more than that? Excellent question. So the way I kind of think about it is with, with 20 victorious runs in a row, it used to be that you would get smaller streaks, five wins, six wins, seven wins, and then somewhere along the way there'd be a a loss and then you get another win back another win streak after that so you'd have like five wins then one loss then six wins and for me getting to 20 meant figuring out how to turn just those couple of losing low roll one runs into winning ones to keep the chain going mm -hmm. so and that grit determination grit adaptability grit. yes grit actually i have a specific run to talk about when it comes to grit and morale and uh -huh. just keeping your head level-headed. Definitely um, outside of Slay the Spire strategy itself, waking up and playing runs of Slay the Spire and being dialed in and winning for this many days in a row is just mentally taxing. Absolutely, 100%. I, I think that being able to consistently or approach the game with a, a fresh and able mind is required when you're trying to get this many win streaks in a row. You have to show up, you know, 10 days, 20 days in a row and be able to concentrate and focus and not tilt or any of that. The longer the win streak gets, the more of a, a test of your own mental fortitude or even just your own um, routine and consistency. Sometimes that can be out of, out of stuff that's out of your control. Like you need to go 20 days in a row without having allergies take your mental capacity away from you. <laughs> yeah. Or you need to be able to recognize those days and decide I'm not going to play the game today. Mm -hmm. For sure. Which is tough as a streamer where playing the game is our job, right? So Definitely. Definitely. This is not a, this is not a competitive thing that I expect anybody else to do or care about because... I don't want anybody to wake up and they're like, oh, I really love streaming Slay the Spire to viewers and I really care very much about my results, but I don't feel like I should stream today because I'm not feeling great. I'd much rather they like are like, well, I'm not streaming great today, but I love Slay the Spire and I love streaming it, so let's get online and stream Slay the Spire and that'll improve my mood. Like, That sounds like a healthier relationship to the game for me, and a lot of the time that's my relationship to the game, and I definitely don't want to like hold the idea that this has to be what you're trying to do while playing Slide the Spire and doing like that idea is kind of like to me it's a bit ableist it's a bit it's very stressful it's definitely it's not something that I think people should feel like they have to do unless they want to in which case cool nor is it necessarily what you need to set out to do I'll say because I wouldn't even necessarily that I was trying to sure. win as many games in a row as possible. Sometimes you just win. Uh, I very Yeah, sometimes you just win. I very much focus on playing the game for my own enjoyment as well as the entertainment of my community. And sometimes I will make different choices than might be optimal for that reason. Myself as well. Uh, but, but I think those ultimately help my relationship with the game, which is required for my play with the game to exist. So there's a, a sort of weird... I have to be suboptimal in order to remain optimal kind oh, yeah. of interaction going on there. The way I frame that for myself, I'm going to, I think that this is, I think it's time to get into runs here. I have to go back to the start. It takes a while these days. 
Um, yeah, I've had your first failed run up here this whole time. Oh, thank you. <laughs> the way that I framed that is, let's say I'm in a win streak and I want to turn that loss into a win. And when you get a run that would usually be a loss for you and Slay This Fire, you're generally not presented the choices that you're comfortable with or used to or that you think are strong, right? You're not going to get your most normal floor one common pick that leads to a one run. You're going to get offered some weird cards that you're not used to using. And if I, Definitely. if I want to win that run instead of lose it, I want to have practiced runs in tons and tons and tons of different conditions. So in order to keep the game fresh for myself and to put myself in situations where I feel like I'm going to be comfortable adapting in a, like a high pressure situation, if you're 115 in a row and you're trying to win a 16th, that feels pretty stressful sometimes. That's a lot of time invested if you care about win streaks at all. That's higher stakes than anything else I've ever done in Spire. There aren't like tournaments with money in this game or anything. And the reason I say this is that in the loss before this win streak on floor one, in a slime boss act, I was offered metallicized perfected strike and fire breathing and took metallicized. And I don't perfected strike fire breathing. Hmm. I don't think I'd like ever do that in a win streak, really. It's possible that I have a whale bonus that gives me a ton of damage here, so I don't need Perfected Strike or Fire Breathing, but like Fire Breathing's great here if I want to take sentries and slime boss out of my pool of threatening enemies. And Perfected Strike is great here for having damage for Gremlin Knob and Lagavulin. And I think I just took Metallicize because I wanted to see what a run on Ironclad with Metallicize start looks like. Because... Yeah, I completely respect that decision making. I, I make choices yeah. like that all the time. Yeah. Because I need to know stuff like that because I may be forced to play one in a win streak and I don't want that to be the first time ever. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Getting, getting experience with all sorts of conditions. Yeah. yeah. So I took Metallicize on floor one in this loss and I think the other thing that I saw, I got an early combust. So I have this weird deck going on where I have like two powers that do damage over time, which sort of incentivizes me to have more defense. Then I got an Apotheosis, and I'm like, okay, cool, so my defense will upgrade. That's a good way to have more defense. I guess I got Apotheosis at the Whale, which is why I took Metallicize, because I figured my strikes could do more damage. Working backwards here. But the big thing for me is, like, I think Anger's the strongest Ironclad common in my experience, and I think that this deck could definitely use it and that it's good against Slime Boss. But I just wanted to see, I guess, could I make this run work leaning more into this like play defensive cards and let the powers do stuff angle because i didn't take anger which is likely why i lost the game <laughs> um <laughs> anger is definitely a definitely good against slime boss something i've learned yeah so then i walked into the slime boss fight with 37 hp a whirlwind a combust plus an apotheosis and a paper frog and just died <laughs> nice, bummer Sucks to die, but also, if anything, I enjoy dying in Slay the Spire more than I enjoy winning, so it's not like I'm that upset about it. Yeah, I, I think I think you learn more when you die than when you win a lot of the time. It's definitely easier to take lessons out of the runs, which are close losses, than it is to take runs out of the set of runs which you win overall. There are some close mm, wins mm -hmm. where there are a lot of interesting things, but every loss is close at some point because... At some point, your health did get close to and eventually crossed the zero line. Not every yes. win is close at yeah. any point. True. All right. So I don't think we need to get into every single decision for these runs. Uh, mine are all up on YouTube. I think yours are all up on your YouTube as well. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. And, and we should link to the playlist. In yes. The description that will of this be video for each of those. Below so the description of the video. All the runs sure. talking about. Um. This is a silent run that's a little bit weird for sure because it's a dead branch silent run and dead branch is always going to make your runs different from runs that don't have dead branch. Definitely. Also, the thing that stands out to me about this one is a mark of the bloom run. I don't see these too often for from sure. other players. Dead branch. A very, very cool. Made event in four cards per turn. I would say that I take mark of the bloom... I think fighting the Act 1 boss is kind of the default at that event. And then your conditions for taking two normalities for 999 gold are like 
you have Omamori is <laughs> an obvious reason to do that. Or you have a shop coming up very quickly and perhaps also have a courier would be another reason to do it. And your conditions for upgrading all cars in the deck are like, well, you just have to understand what happens if you upgrade all of the cars in your deck and make a choice. <laughs> um, it's a very committal choice to not be able to gain your health at any point in any way for the rest of the run. Lizard Tail doesn't yeah. work, Fairy in a Bottle doesn't work. Uh, nothing works anymore. Yeah, for me, that choice is all about recognizing, like, when does the fully upgraded deck just stop taking damage? And that's usually if there's a ton of draw upgrades and a ton of energy upgrades that you're getting all at once. Yep, I would say Runic Pyramid plus Apparitions to suddenly have three Apparitions is a really big one to you. Yeah. Sometimes you'll have a deck which is very close to being infinite and like upgrading your adrenalines and acrobatics or something like that will just end the run sort of clearly. Um, you can also think about it like just in terms of the value of the upgrades. I got 22 upgrades from this Mind Bloom. How much That's health an does an upgrade save you um, in the remaining fights of the run? Looking at what fights you think are left in the run. Like... If an upgrade can save me, I don't know, like one to two health f over all of the fights that are left in the run, then taking 22 upgrades should save me like 40 health. And that's pretty comparable to how much I could like rest and sustain for and get the heal after the bosses. So that's another framework that's useful for me in approaching it is just like how valuable is an upgrade for this deck? How value is sustained for the stack? If I had a pantograph, uh, this choice would have been much more weighted against taking the mark of the bloom. But yeah, this is like a silent run. Scrolling over real quick, I got to 16 HP against Slime Boss, but I did not get lower than that at any point in the entire run, I don't believe. So, not too bad. Pretty easy one off the dead branch early. Uh, win number two is a Runic Pyramid Defect deck. This is, I would say, I win as defect in two main ways. One is to do some sort of card spam thing with recycle. And the other is to do some sort of scaling thing with orbs. And I've certainly won with defect in other ways, but everything else relies on different things to get started whereas both of those ways to win is defect just sort of rely on compile driver and cool headed and hmm. so my defect strategy is based fairly heavily around taking cards like compile driver and cool headed because card draw is good for everything and then that card draw very naturally transitions into putting orbs in play and making them stronger or doing some sort of infinite thing in this case uh this deck had some trouble finding block. Um, I remember finding it very funny that I had three equilibriums in my deck after taking Runic Pyramid after at the end of Act German, 1. Yeah. <laughs> but I just was not offered very many sensible block cards, so that's what I ended up taking. And yeah, it ended up... It's a Runic Pyramid deck. These tend to be very, very strong by the time they survive to late game. I used to um, expect to skip almost every elite after taking a runic pyramid at the end of act one because um well the low cost cards weren't as strong so your deck wasn't as strong going into act two back then and also i just knew that i could win almost for sure if i made it to even like the start of act three like runic pyramid really starts to get going if you pick up another boss relic and get a fourth energy or something even for a mediocre deck but nowadays, I'll take Runic Pyramid and be like, oh, I have Runic Pyramid. Cool. I will also kill all the elites in Act 2. Yeah. Because <laughs> um, the strength of a lot of the cards has just increased, and perhaps my ability to build the decks to let me do that has increased as well. And that is what happened there. All right. Watch your run. I will probably not be talking a ton about Watch Your Runs. I will say that I find Watch Your Runs very interesting for the first 15 floors these days, and then they often stop being interesting. Um, Watcher can definitely have some very similar mid and late games. Yes. Yes, very, very, very much so. So I think that the really interesting thing on Watcher in terms of strategy is trying to work out if it is worth it to take value cards early on to make yourself 
perhaps a little bit stronger going through Act 2. But in doing so, make it harder to get down to 8 cards to go infinite in the hard fight with Rushdown and things like Rushdown, like Mental Fortress, Inner Peace, Empty Mind, and stuff like that. Because there are... Yeah, there's there are a lot of infinites for Watcher. Yes. Once you get yeah, down to I'm basically about to say that. Once you get down to that number of cards, but if you're above that number of cards, that doesn't really work, and you have to engage with the card pool a lot more. You have to um, start working out how are you going to block an attack for 67 on turn two of the hard fight and stuff like that. Where with an infinite, it's like, well, I will be infinite, um, which is an easy answer to the question. And lately, I have been erring more towards just going for eight cards every time. And this is a watcher run where I did this, and so are all of the other ones, I think. <laughs> um, so I took a crush joints to deal damage. I got a Mercury Hourglass. I bought a Rushdown on floor 10, which I go back and forth about buying Rushdown early. Because um, you definitely run into some elite and other fights, uh, especially in Act 2, where your turn 1 just is... Too much damage and your rush down in hand isn't doing anything uh and there are also other ways to win that don't require rush down i ended up taking apparitions which i don't always do but that helps with your slow start and then i won and then i won and if you've seen me play watcher before you've seen how that happens and if you've seen a variety of other people play watcher before you've also seen how that happens so yeah all right ironclad run with 37 cards and a sundial and a corruption so oh, big be glad yes it also has two flashes of steel so despite the fact that this deck has 37 cards in it uh like it has three offerings um this deck one off an infinite i'm pretty sure which is very common as ironclad you have so much exhaust available and your card pool includes dropkick and Rage and Sundial is an uncommon relic. Like you often just accidentally build an infinite, even if you were trying to do something else. Yeah, there's one of my favorite ways for Ironclad to be victorious is this forty card deck that then exhausts down to a, a subset of five or so, and you've got double tap, drop kick, pummel strike, something like that, flash of steel mm -hmm. that can loop very simply. You may or may not have Sundial. You can use a Rage for Bash, but it's it's ultimately all about the the burning pact and the fiend fire and second wind second wind dark stuff. embrace dark embrace is huge anytime you're doing that dark embrace is is probably my favorite ironclad card i think it's one of the most breakable cards yeah, yeah it's very 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 strong arguably more so than a rushdown even except it's not free true it used to be that dark embrace was the rare card and corruption was the uncommon card and then those rarities were switched and some patch in Slow the Spire's history. I don't remember exactly I, when. I remember that. I still feel like it was a buff to both cards when they did that. Yeah. Yes, so do I, actually. Um, and lots of people in my chat when I'm playing with Corruption will be like, remember when Corruption was uncommon? You could do this like every run. And it was so easy. It was so broken. And I'm like sitting there thinking like, okay, but Dark Embrace is uncommon now. <laughs> and it's like just as strong. The two... The two resources in the game that matter the most are energy and card draw, and Corruption gives you basically unlimited energy, and Dark Embrace gives you basically unlimited card draw, so... That's very well put. Very breakable cards. That's why it's broken, yeah. Yeah. All right. Silent Run. I got to play a 1,000 cuts plus in this run, which is one oh, of my good. favorite things to do with Silent. I find that I can often justify taking a 1,000 cuts if it's a Slime Boss Act in Act 1. I say justify because, like, I really want to take it. But you do have to justify it. It's so yeah. expensive. It costs two. <laughs> two is so much energy. I, I only have very, very few victorious a thousand cuts decks on a a twenty heart. But huh. I agree. It's, if you, you don't very often see thousand cuts in Act One before Slime Boss. True. But if you do, you get to yeah. take it. It's kind of cool. Yeah, which is very awesome. I think this deck actually took it a bit later. I don't know when exactly I took it. Oh no, I bought it on floor 5 at a merchant. Okay, well, I don't know what I was doing, but I guess I chose to do that. <laughs> anyway, I like the card. I do like the card. Yeah. And I think that, um, like, I take Adrenaline over Wraith form very often on Silent these days. Um, 
I think that this is a character where you have so much availability of acceleration to set up powers, and the powers are very good, um, that you can do stuff like that. I would say the acceleration is slightly less available than the powers, so I think I take the acceleration over the powers usually, but mm. yeah, like I'm taking adrenalines, I'm... I already have a centennial puzzle in my deck in Act 1. I'm taking anchors and bag of preps very high, and I take acro on floor zero now, which is a fascinating change to how I've played silent. And I'll talk about that more later. I don't really want to get into it a ton here. But this run has five copies of acrobatics and a thousand cuts, and I think that's pretty sweet. That's, pretty sweet. <laughs> that's, that's my general opinion of this run. Looks like bronze scales probably put in some work too. Bronze Scales is so good. It hits so many times. I think this might be the only Snekoi run of the entire win streak for me. I have not been taking Snekoi as often as I used to at all. Um, but yeah, this is like a Meteor Strike, a Snekoi, and 24 other cards. Uh, is my Meteor basic Strike opinion is of this deck. such a breakable card. It very, very, very much is, even without Snekoi. Um, Agreed. Yeah. I'm I'm rapidly approaching the the place where I think it might be correct to just pick Meteor Strike if you see it. Yeah, I've been there before for sure. Um, if I have anything building energy in any way, if, if I have a charge battery in Act 1, uh, and I have a deck which can afford to have a dead draw sometimes, which is a thing that's tricky to judge sometimes, but like if you have Compile Drivers in Act 1 and Cool Headeds in Act 1, which like I said is how I tend to prioritize cards on Defect early, um, you get to have a dead card in your draw. Like It's much less painful. Um, and if I like also have a Charge Battery or a Turbo or a Lantern or a Happy Flower or anything like that, I'm often interested in taking Meteor Strike early before I can even realistically cast it. I mean, you can get an Energy Potion, you can get a Liquid Memories. Liquid Memories is such a cool potion to have in the oh, game. Yeah. I, getting started with with uh, Meteor Strike using a potion is one of my favorite. Mm -hmm. I've had runs that just like feigned cheating Meteor Strike into play like three different ways. Yeah. It was like Ancient Tea Set into Energy Potion into Liquid Memories for three fights in a row or something. Yep. Just get through Act 1 that way. And then eventually you'll reach a point where you can just like play it off your Sneko Eye, or use like Seek Plus that you've bottled to get Aggregate and Meteor Strike on turn one and then draw your entire deck and, you know, it gets stronger and stronger. That card is also one of my best, my favorite use cases for Enlightenment, a colorless card that has mostly no use, but <laughs> if you can make Meteor Strike cost one, it's pretty good. Enlightenment does not feature in this set of runs, but I have had it in my deck in my life. <laughs> That's about as positively as I can speak about Enlightenment. I really wish I could say that in my 20 streak included the, the run that I won off the back of uh, Forethought Plus, but I don't think that's the one. I had a Forethought recently, I think. Or maybe I already had a setup and was considering a Forethought, but didn't take it. Mm -hmm. uh, this Watcher run went to 4 HP against Guardian, and then you know won very, 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 very easily after that. Do you remember the last time you died to Guardian? I've gotten really close recently, but I can't can't remember in living memory when it happened. I've died to Guardian in the last hundred runs, I'm pretty sure, but I don't remember the run. But also, like, if I'm not in the middle of a win streak, sometimes even if I am in the middle of a win streak, I often do very experimental and weird things. I don't always like consider losing a run to be a failure. Like, mm -hmm. Sometimes I just want to like try to lean into a certain set of cards and stuff, and sometimes they don't beat Guardian. <laughs> uh, whoops. <laughs> I think Guardian like got me for real though. At one point in the last hundred runs, sometimes your deck is really bad at the end of Act One. <laughs> Berserk. I'm pretty sure I transformed into Berserk here, but um, Berserk is a tricky card to get a lot of value out of because. Usually I want a card to make me stronger the turn I play it, and this one <laughs> makes makes the enemies yeah. attack me for 50% more damage and doesn't do anything, which isn't it's very good. It's got that really nasty combo of immediate downside and delayed upside. Yeah. It's so hard to take. For sure. Um, I do think that with Runic Pyramid, um, Berserk sometimes does... <sighs> 
okay even is pushing it. Sometimes Berserk isn't worse than Strike in my deck if I <laughs> some, some if I have a Runic Pyramid. <laughs> and so I, I'm pretty sure that I transformed into it here and just ended up keeping it. But it's cool that yeah, Berserk it looks featured like... in one of the runs. If, if you're intangible via apparitions, then there's no downside to being vulnerable. That's the one way about it. You also have that Clockwork is Souvenir true. to block it yeah, later clockwork, like the run. Yeah, it's like a very, very late addition to the run here. Um, this is a pretty cool deck, which I think ultimately mostly won because it had 174 HP when it entered the heart fight. It has a feed plus and a runic pyramid, so anytime you do that on Ironclad, you, you just sort of reach a state where it doesn't really matter that much if your deck is bad because like enemies aren't going to deal like 150 damage to you really no no i've had i've had a lot of runs like this and it, some of them beat the heart taking like 20 damage some of them beat the heart taking 120 damage but yeah in the end they all win yeah uh i think i've had one ironclad run in my life where i lost with more than like 120 max hp and that deck was really bad <laughs> um it's it's really enlightening to me sometimes, actually, because you'll get into the heart fight with a deck that would have died earlier um, this way, just because you had such a huge max HP buffer that your poor deck manages to survive that long and you end up fighting the heart with it. And you get to see what a deck does against the heart, which usually would have just died earlier. Anyway, this one's actually, like, yeah. I had cool. double Whirlwind, Chemex, and Shuriken, and I had a lot of exhaust to get me down to a point where I was drawing both of those war ones every turn and just chemexing both of them and then I have nunchaku here as well so I could like chemex a war one for zero have nunchaku gain me an energy and then pommel strike plus to get both of them back so okay. eight energy from chemex in one turn was happening Love that. fairly regularly at the end of this run yeah I don't it's not that hard a synergy to find once you have the stuff available to you to build it, but I don't remember ever using it before, which is just like, that's such a cool thing about this game that you can constantly find new things to do. Even if you're not really looking for them, it'll just sort of give them to you, and as long as you're willing to let it, you can end up doing lots of cool stuff. This deck also has a thousand cuts. Maybe one thing that will come out of this call is that you will... Um, it will strengthen you to take thousand cuts more often. I, I, hope, I hope it does. Was this another slime boss act one, a thousand cuts, or did you take this it after? This is slime boss in act one, and I was offered a thousand cuts on floor eight. So I think in wow, this run, you would probably. Two silent runs back to back? That's funny. Well, the previous one was Hexagos, not um, slime boss, actually. Oh. I just really wanted thousand cuts. <laughs> I can see why. <laughs> um, <laughs> this, I would say, is a. Semi-typical, very strong silent deck to me. Double calculated gamble, double adrenaline. When you have those cards, you are just going to be able to put everything in play on turn one a lot of the time. And yeah. you just need something to put in play on turn one. And in this run, the stuff I have to play on turn one is kind of weird. Like I have an accuracy plus, but I don't actually generate any shivs. <laughs> Um, I transformed well, into that dance. with Frozen Egg. Oh, there's a Blade Dance. Okay. So I generate some yeah. shivs. I don't generate zero shivs. I'm pretty sure that I... Did I take that? Anyway, regardless, it's not an incredible accuracy plus. But this deck is just going to use Reflex and Tactician with um, Calculated Gamble to play a billion cards every turn. And that'll win... Yeah, I, I see a lot of successful Siren Little Runs that look like this. Two two energy relics from bosses, lots of card draw, gambles, acrobatics, and then lots of powers and stuff. Yeah. That tends to work quite well. I would say that those are the, like the two main axes that I see Silent winning off of are your incredible powers. And like the furthest you can get on that axis is like having a footwork plus and a nightmare and just very slowly making twelve dexterity from those two cards and then you win. Um, and then the other axis is her acceleration. And the furthest you can get on that axis is like there was a run recently where I made 300 block by playing 400 plus cards on turn one of the heart fight and just won off that block <laughs> with calipers. And my deck didn't have a footwork in it. It didn't have an abacus in it. The reason I had to do that on turn one was that once I became frail, I was not going to be able to make block anymore. 
but I just like was gaining two block every now and then with Survivor, and that was that. And I played 400 plus cards in turn one, and I also applied 200 poison to the heart, so that was a three turn. Uh, is it a zero damage three turn heart kill? I don't know. But anyway, that'll happen. This is a Beautiful. defect deck with a runic capacitor, which is always super exciting to me. I really like being able to do fun things with orbs and defect and one of the tricky things is where you're going to get your orb slots from inserters slow capacitor you have to draw and play capacity potion is enough for one fight but you only get it to use it once so anytime that i have runic inserter runic capacitor sorry on a defect run i'm very excited uh it lets you prioritize the cards that generate good orbs more heavily and not worry as much about getting your orb slots into play as quickly um fission for me yeah i was just about to mention that fission that looks like it was doing a lot of work so oh, what was it like three and a half years ago crimson blur went tenno on defect for the first time and he very very strongly believed that you just took the cards that were good on turn one that drew you cards on turn one and scaled your orbs defensively and you needed like a doom and gloom or something and that would kill every enemy in the game um which i think is true and <laughs> for the most part i Dude, went Bloom kills everything yeah i went 10 or no playing defect like very similarly to how he played defect i think he developed his defect style by looking at how i played defect and um refining is a good word for it but also like exaggerating it <laughs> Like, he hmm. saw that I was really valuing getting blocks set up on turn one and two and stuff, and he was just like, I had these anchors in my brain where I was like, but there are other cards that are good too that I should take some time. And he looked at how I was playing Defect and was like, actually, no, the thing you're doing that's strong is this. I'm going to do only it. And did very, very well with it. And then I watched him doing that, and I was like, oh, whoa, that's cool. And then I went even further into it. And so now I'm at a point where vision for me is maybe the strongest defect rare at this point because of what happens if you have four cool headed and efficient in your deck yeah um if you're a four cool headed and a fusion and a vision it's gonna mm -hmm. be good and i've had multiple defect runs recently where i've taken strange spoon for it um because if you don't exhaust your fission you get to play it more than one time on turn one <laughs> a lot of the time and those runs are ludicrous. But like Hologram will get it back, or failing that, you will just draw your entire deck and go through it a second time. So Beautiful. This is a really sweet defect run like that. Watcher. Um, this was a really cool Watcher run because Battle Him Plus uh, actually did a ton here. And Battle Him is a slow card. Um, a lot of Watcher decks do not need to win slowly because they win quickly yeah ultimately a, a lot of watcher cards that say do this next turn or do something one time per turn end up kind of falling flat because you don't really take that many turns exactly yes um, but this run didn't get a rush down until floor 54 and so until then it was just trying to do a lot of stuff every turn and battle him was a lot of my damage for a lot of the run also like doesn't have a ton of great stand swapping stuff and everything it's a it's a different type of watcher deck from what i'm used to winning as all right we don't need to talk about watcher that much though it looks looks pretty solid there's an ironclad run that started with disarm which is always really interesting to me because disarm is not very good against gremlinov or sentries but it's such a strong ironclad card that i usually i usually at least feel like i'm making a decision with disarm on floor one against Hero is against a wild strike, so that's like a pretty decent act one damage common. I don't know if I'm you have. I think I'm okay now. Never taking a wild strike. Oh, never a wild strike. Never. I certainly don't think it's Ironclad's best damage common by any stretch of the imagination, but I have definitely taken it to upgrade it to have something that deals seventeen for one to kill Gremlin Knob. Yeah, if if you need a Gremlin Knob answer, it does work. Yeah. I will begrudgingly admit this. It plays nicely <laughs> with Bash, too. It's, it's not bad. 
yes, I also definitely value the Ironclad damage cards that cost zero or one going through Act One with Bash. Definitely helps a lot. I was curious ever... where I got Demon Form here. I bought no, I got Demon Form from the Slavers Elite on floor twenty-five in this run. Because I, I don't do the strength thing on Ironclad very often at all. But I believe here I have a Magic Flower already, and I picked up a Reaper later, if I remember right. But I think looking at the Demon Forum, I was like, I haven't quite solved the Act 2 boss yet. I have a Choker this run, so the infinite isn't really available. Um, Demon Forum opens up an easy win for me off of Reaper later, and I might as well just take it. Demon Forum is a, a huge... Huge pick for me with uh, Velvet Choker and Ironclad specifically. Yeah. It's just so much value yeah. per cards played. Yes, exactly. Velvet Choker changes card evaluations a decent amount. What was your question you were going to? Oh, I was going to ask, um, I guess in this this run specifically, how did your bash get upgraded? Because I was going to ask, uh, do, you, do you upgrade bash much these days? I definitely upgrade bash sometimes. Uh, if I upgrade Bash, it is generally because I haven't found a great way to deal damage in Act 1 and I need something that will kill an Act 1 Elite. So it's it's not an upgrade that I make thinking, oh, this will be great throughout the run. It is just you need to collect some things that will kill your Act 1 Elite on floor yeah. 7 or 8 or whatever, and upgrading Bash is better than upgrading Strike, at least. Um most of the time. <laughs> Most of the time. Usually. So that's what happened here. I had a clothesline in my deck and a feel no pain as I went into the campfire before the Act 1 Elite. I had disarm oh. clothesline, feel no pain. So I can upgrade clothesline there, but I think bash is sensible. I also did have 73 out of 73 health, so I wasn't like in super heavy amounts of danger. I've actually lost my last two ironclad runs to sentries, which is hmm. tough. I feel like the first time it was metallicizing super elite sentries and that's like okay, that's fair. That's a pretty bad elite. But the second time it was just like regular sentries and I thought my deck killed them and then I didn't win, which sentries give you so many dazes. There's so much variance in the second half of the fight and also there's variance in whether you draw your damage cards in a way that easily starts killing them uh in the first deck cycle. So huh. It'll happen sometimes, I guess. I guess. All right. This is another silent run with like Adrenaline and Sundial. And in this one, I didn't get the acrobatics that I usually love to get. So I had to make do with double tools of the trade, double reflex and predator. But I mean, I made do basically. Yeah. This first two relics, Shuriken Tingsha looks pretty fun, actually. Yeah, and I have double blade dance in this deck. Um, so that's a decent amount of damage. Shuriken and Kunai have definitely gone down in evaluation for me in Silent Runs a massive, massive, massive amount. It used to be that like Kunai was the relic you wanted to see on Ascension 15, I felt like. And nowadays definitely. like I just you don't take really cloak and dagger. care a lot of the time. <laughs> Right, nowadays, even if I have a kunai, I still don't take Cloak and Dagger. Whereas it used to be like, I will take Cloak and Dagger to make sure my kunai wins if I find it. Um, so the amount that I've moved away from that little synergistic space is pretty dramatic to me. This was an interesting silent run because I just very, very heavily was struggling to find card draw for a lot of the run. And I just had to make do with reflexes eventually, but they worked. Um, reflexes and i think the predator is actually a late addition which is predator is such an interesting card because i will usually take it in act one because it's a very good damage card in act one but i also sometimes have runs where card draw is so important late game that i'm okay with paying two energy for two cards next turn that's just like an okay trade that's kind of how i feel about wheel kick on watcher a little bit it's a very similar card actually right yeah identical damage this yeah. turn draw next turn very draw. similar very very rarely but sometimes my watcher run needs draw enough that wheel kick is like hey that's pretty good and there was even one time going back to enlightenment as a card i think i made a double wheel kick enlightenment sundial <laughs> infinite that's really cool which was pretty funny yeah yeah, they're both cards where like there's a strong reason to take them, which is at its most relevant in Act One, and then becomes less relevant. 
and there's a different strong reason to take them, which is at its least relevant in Act 1, and then becomes very relevant later, potentially. Although often you'll have gotten card draw some other way that's better by the time you reach that point of the run. The strong I, was... I really like that kind of mechanical pairing in Slay the Spire on, on so yeah. many cards and their yeah, core really cool. You've got this numeric effect that has value early on, most importantly, and then a secondary effect that has value late on, most importantly. Yeah, for sure. This run was 3 hours and 17 minutes long, which I think might have been Ooh. the longest run of the streak. I, I think that's longer than any of mine. I definitely... I usually... Okay, back in the day, I used to play like 4 hours was sort of where I was aiming. If I was around about 10 and 0 or better in a win streak on any of the characters or rotating, I like very deliberately... The way if you want to think about... If you think that you can improve your win rate by spending longer on a run, which is something you might think about yourself or might not, it's not necessarily true that that's the case, but maybe you do, and I did at the time. Um, and you want to generate lots of win streaks, which again, I wanted to at the time, but you certainly don't have to want that. Um, Something that makes sense to do is to play runs pretty quickly when you don't have a win streak and to spend a lot more time and energy on the runs later when you do have a win streak. And so I used to be a lot more extravagant with that. I was like playing hour to an hour and a half long runs with no wins and then playing four to six hour runs when I did have wins. Nowadays, I just don't do that as much anymore. I think for me, it's always been interesting to play runs in different ways. It's just like fun to play a fast run sometimes and a slow run sometimes. And win streaks used to be my justification for playing a slow run. But as I've matured as a player and a streamer, I've started to realize that like sometimes I just feel like playing a slow run and I'll play the slow run then. So my slowest run is like a 12 hour long defect run uh, where I actually at some point opened uh, opened a software development tool and started writing simulators for my deck. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and that was a really really fun thing to do and then i also did like a floor per day ironclad yes. run which made it to like it's gonna mention your floor per day floor 13 or something where my rule was i had to spend an hour every floor and i just had to find something to analyze for an hour <laughs> even if it's like a campfire where i'm very clearly upgrading a particular card i still have to analyze for an hour every floor that's the rule and that was really fun but yeah generally Generally, when I'm in a win streak, I just sort of do my normal play, and I'm okay with losing a win streak because I decided to play a two-hour run instead of an eight-hour run. I don't feel bad about that at this point in my life. Yeah, I don't. Th I don't think you should. There's, there's always the opportunity to get a new one. After all. Yeah, yeah, and it happens. It will continue to happen. Um, the runs where you start with fairly poor relics and then get a runic pyramid are some of my favorite runs to play in Slay the Spire. I'm not sure they're necessarily the most interesting runs to play in Slay the Spire, but for me, the, the coolest feeling, we're looking at the defect run now, uh, the coolest mm -hmm. feeling for me is feeling like you're behind going into Act 2 and seeing your deck turn the corner. Um, I think that was a much more pronounced feeling in Slay the Spire for me, Back in the day on earlier balance patches where win rates were much lower, um, Act 2 was much more threatening. Cards available in Act 1 were much worse. And so you'd sometimes just see your deck really struggle through Act 2 and survive fights with like less than 5 HP multiple times in a row, and then you like get that one event and boom, all of a sudden you're a late game deck and you win. And I kind of feel like the bad relics in Act 1 into Runic Pyramid runs um, resemble that a little bit. Here I had an Apotheosis, which, yeah, I never dropped below 56 health in Act 2, so <laughs> maybe not very relevant for this run, but, you know, Pyramid, Pyramid, Pyramid's really strong. Plus, yeah. Pyramid with Boot Sequence Plus, I love exactly. Boot Sequence Pyramid. Yeah. This is a messy, messy Watcher run, and this Watcher run is sort of like... It is my belief that this sort of Watcher deck with double omniscience and four talk to the hands and two mental fortresses and 29 cards 
is much, <laughs> much, 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 much harder to play correctly than the Watcher deck with like Rushdown, Mental Fortress, and three Scrawls and six other cards. Like a deck like this is just going to be weird to play. Um. In this run, I struggled very heavily to get relevant card draw and relics early on. It looks like Mummified Hand's a really strong relic, but if you look at my deck, I just didn't have many powers. Um, it was very hard for me to work out how to block for a really, really long time. And at the end of Act 3, I like took a Foresight Plus because I was like, well, there are like two cards in my deck that I'm going to need to find. Uh, and I have a Mummified Hand, I guess. And then I took a Talk to the Hand Plus on floor 42, a Talk to the Hand Unupgraded on floor 44, a Talk to the Hand Unupgraded on floor 45, a Mental Fortress oh, Upgraded on floor 46, yeah. bought a Mental Fortress on floor 47, um, and, and then went into the boss fights, um, where I, I started the boss fights with 7 HP in this run at the end of Act wow. 3. Um, my deck was very, 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 very bad, and got bailed out at the end which is like i actually lost my previous win streak to a watcher run watcher runs when you win are very samey and easy but the watcher runs where you have to like where the card rewards and the enemies in the spire force you to deviate away from the really easy win that's available to watchers card pool get so like complicated and weird sometimes yeah, no kidding. Anyway, this was a cool watch around, for sure. Yeah, I, Foresight is a, a cool card, um, particularly in conjunction with Omniscience. I don't know if you ended up using the Omniscience on the Foresight in this run, but I've had yes, quite a bit I of success. Yes, absolutely did. Yeah, I've had a quite and... a bit of success doing that, scrying like 10 cards every turn. You just pick pick the five that you want to draw Yeah, and make block that way. For sure. I also have a golden eye, which means that when I was scrying, I was scrying at two additional cards. There's lots of interesting things in a deck like this where you want to make sure that you end with zero cards in your draw pile or lots of cards in your draw pile, because if you end with like four cards in your draw pile, your scroll your scry for twelve at the start of next turn is going to be a lot less relevant. Oh yeah, I've made the mistake of playing tantrum with no cards in the draw pile and then yep. scrying it. Oof. <laughs> yes. That's <laughs> not fun. Um, also, anytime you have double omniscience and wish, you get to play the fun mini game of trying to omniscience your wish without losing the fight. Like, how am I going to get sixty gold here without dying? And the old omniscience. I mean, one of the reasons that I won this game was that when I entered my store on floor forty-seven, I had eight hundred gold. So I bought Mental Fortress, Panic Button, War Paint, Fire Potion, Bottled Miracle, and got a card remove. And I had 7 health before then, and then I entered the boss fights with 7 health. But all of that stuff helped me out a lot for winning. Scrappy, I like it. Yeah. This is such a weird Ironclad run. Ironclad to me is the character where, when I look at my decks, it's like I entered a Fuge State. For two or three hours and I have no idea what happened and I guess I won. <laughs> it's always this big pile of 30 plus cards. Yeah and I have certainly had ironclad runs which aren't that but for me it's weird. I like I feel very comfortable understanding how a silent defect or watcher deck consistently wins without um, bloating with value cards, I guess, early on in runs. But I do not have a comfortable way to do that on Ironclad yet, and perhaps other people have worked it out, but I tend to uh, try to explore strategy spaces on my own. Um, so I haven't like gone and looked. Uh, I haven't seen anyone do it. Yeah. Maybe there's some way that someone will work it out at some point, but yeah, for now, it feels like my Ironclad decks fill up with a lot of weird cards, and then weird things happen. <laughs> we don't. We don't. But sometimes either. it's winning, and that's good. Yeah. A lot of the time, it's winning. Yeah. I did get a lot of Runic Pyramids in this, uh, in this set of runs, so looking at the Silent Run next, this is like a dream. Silent run for me. This is what I want every silent run to be. Yeah, Maybe got a little short on energy. 
two eggs, Pandora's box, runic pyramid, pellets, preserved insect, kuna. Yeah, that's pretty perfect. Yep, and double adrenaline plus four acrobatics, a tactician plus double prepared plus. So this deck is maybe missing one more energy card um, away from just being able to do everything on turn one every time, basically. Yeah, just missing a tactician. And it used to be that I took a predator on floor one, which I think has to be very, very, very high to my like most important card to see on floor one for silent. Maybe not most important because it's like an uncommon, so you don't see it often, but like the card I am happiest to see on floor one. Uh, so happy to I see might, a predator on floor one. Might rate terror higher, but not much higher. Uh, and then by the time that I was at a floor six, I also had an acrobatics and a sneaky strike, which I upgraded. So that's one of the huge things for me about the buffs to silence discard strategies. I think that like, okay. So for me, I used to love the balance of silent very much. Um, I thought that silent had a direct damage package of cards, like dagger sprays and shivs and stuff like that, which were strong in the first half of the run. And you'd usually want or have to take some of those cards in order to survive the first half of the run. And then she also had this really interesting poison package, and that damage was better later on in the run and had some combo elements to it and also scaling over time, which is very good for the boss gauntlet. And she had a discard package, and that was good later on in the run because card draw becomes more important later in the run. You have more ability to control which cards you draw and play every turn. You can match acrobatics to reflex or tactician easily and stuff like that, right? That's and right. I thought that made silent runs really interesting to play because I'd have a deck with a few dagger sprays and other damage commons in it, and then I'd try to work out how I was going to transform that deck into something that made sense for the end of the run. And nowadays it's just like the stuff is so strong that you don't need the direct damage necessarily ever. You can just start building your late game deck on floor zero. Um, and that's what I've been doing with a lot of success on silent recently. And it just kind of feels wrong, like by buffing, because all the, a bunch of the like shift stuff and direct damage stuff got buffed. And then at the same time or later, a bunch of the discard stuff all got buffed and also yeah, there like, were buffs to explosion happened. Eviscerate and reflex and slice and yep. blade dance and. And it feels like by, by buffing cards that weren't seeing much play so that they can see play, like if you're not recognizing where their spot in the character's like arc through run was, you risk making them way too prominent and having them overcrowd the strategic space and um, get rid of a lot of the other cards that used to be getting picked all the time because they needed to be, but now you just don't need them. That's kind of how I feel about Silent right now. Where like, yeah, it used to be like Sneaky Strike was like, oh, this is like a really weird card because I can just never put together the support for Sneaky Strike fast enough for the damage to it to matter. Like it just, it's a very hard card to justify taking because like you sort of need to have acros and prepareds and card draw going to be discarding a card this turn consistently. And by that point, you don't need a damage common. But nowadays it's like, oh, floor one sneaky strike. Hell yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so it to me. It's a very different feeling. And then she's definitely changed a lot, this character. Yeah, she really time. has. That was 17 runs in a row. Then I yeah, died as defect. Very incredible streak you had. Yeah, I guess so. It's a lot of runs. Um my defect loss. I do generally think that the losses are often the most interesting parts of the streak. But I think this defect loss I actually dug with Shovel, which is not something I do very oh, often. I, I can believe it. But I... Like, there's a huge meme on my channel around Shovel. There used to be runs where if I got Shovel, I was going to dig at every campfire no matter what, and everybody just loved it, and I enjoyed it, and I didn't think it was right, <laughs> but I was going to do it. And then more and more, I felt like targeting upgrades at the right cards was just more valuable than relics, especially when your deck gets smaller and more deliberate. The value of a relic goes down and the value of an upgrade on one of your vital cards goes up. And 
So as the game changed and I got more focused in how I was building decks, um, the idea of digging just got worse. But here I actually just like felt like digging was correct. Um, or maybe I just really wanted to, so I did it. I definitely could have upgraded dual cast instead of digging. And there were like maybe three mistakes I identified. This entire series of runs. Um, so like I said, sometimes I like to play slow, sometimes I like to play fast. And I decided that I wanted to track my mistakes for a while in a spreadsheet. And this entire series of runs basically started the exact moment that I did that. So I had one, two runs before I started tracking mistakes in a spreadsheet. And then I started tracking mistakes in a spreadsheet and I just won 15 runs in a row. And one of the Our really... little introspection. Yeah, but one of the really interesting things about that is you might think like, oh, so by tracking your mistakes, you made it so you weren't making mistakes anymore because you were paying attention on it. Uh, and you might think like, oh, you won 17 runs in a row. You must be really good at this game. And like, is it still fun for you? Like, it seems like it must be super easy. But there are like at least 100 mistakes I noted in that spreadsheet <laughs> over <laughs> over 15 runs. <laughs> so, yeah. So, no. <laughs> Not, and those are only the mistakes I noticed, right? Like, right. You don't. Sure, surely, there's a few that slipped through the cracks too. Yeah, but often, I mean, at the start, I was still very much in the mindset of like, oh, we just vibe and play slow the spire, you know. And so I was noting lots of things like, oh, I could have taken a different run to get Nunchaku to nine at the end of this fight. Um, and as I got further into the streak, and I was focusing very hard on those mistakes, I got to a point where I was like very intuitively doing things like extending fights for three turns to get Nunchaku to nine, which is like a consequence of forcing yourself to examine your mistakes is that you start actually trying not to make them anymore. Um, but I was still making lots of mistakes, lots of other mistakes. And as you realize that you're making some mistakes, you start to notice that you're making other ones too. Um, yeah. There's so much going on in this game. So, 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 so much. So much. Yeah, I don't think anybody makes it through a run of Ascension 20 Slay the Spire without making a mistake somewhere. I have played a Watcher run where I couldn't find a mistake I made, and I won. But on the other hand, Dun -dun. like I just got rushed down Fear No Evil inner piece at the start of the run. So, <laughs> so like, <laughs> oh. <laughs> you know... Mm. Hmm. I have played with those cards a lot of times before. I feel very comfortable with them, and Watcher's fights can end on like turn one or two. And while she's very complicated to play with a complex deck, when your deck is like only eight different cards, there aren't that many choices anymore. So I'm sure I made some mistake in there and just didn't find it, but I I didn't find it as I was doing it. I have also strangely had losses where I didn't find a mistake I made. But that's a lot easier because, like, if you die on floor seven to Gremlin Knob, sometimes it's just like, yeah, I'm comfortable that I should have tried to kill this elite, but a bash was my eleventh card, and uh, uh, I drew five strikes one hand and five defends the other one. So, <laughs> oops, oops, yeah, yeah, it ha happens to the best of us. Gremlin Knob takes his toll from everyone. It'll happen. All right. Tricky dude. Shall we look at some of your runs? Yeah, let's let's switch over looking at my runs. Let's see if I can. Break a little bit. My face cam. There we go. Pull this up on my actual in game screen so I can mouse over some of the details for you. But I know you've got the, the run history images. In look theory. At on your end, George. In theory, I do. At any moment, I will successfully bring them up on my, uh... <laughs> Isn't and running you know, a live show great? It's a good it, time. It's, it's fun. All right, here's... I did it. I'm there. How are you? Intermission. I feel like I should be like playing some uh, violin music or something while we capture spire. 
not cooperating. Oh, I see why. to be disobeying me? Uh-oh. Do we need to pause? Don't think so. Oh, Here, I'll just I'll just use the album that I've got of my own. Yes. Okay. It's on screen a little bit. There, that'll work. All right, so looking at the, the first run here, Silent was the first of the victories. I don't have a whole lot to, to say about this one. This was uh, a very, very strong Silent Run. First Relic Kunai, second Relic Toxic Egg. Oh, so that's it, it so got, much fun. Yeah, it got really out of control very quickly. We ended up with multiple Calculated Gambles, Upgraded Reflex, Upgraded Tactician, lots of four Upgraded Prepareds, just... Cycling through the whole deck, pretty much every turn, destroying everything. There was Kunai Shuriken Ninja Scroll, lots of shivs. Really, really fun. <laughs> That's super cool. But not a whole lot of decision making to talk about too much on yeah. this one. I love that Prepared is good now, because I never used to feel like it was, and it's such a cool card to have be good. Very much so. Yeah, it, it, it's such a, a, a basic card. Yeah, like draw two, discard two. It's not actually directly doing anything, but it's helping you sift yeah. through the deck to get to the, the good stuff. It's a support common for what the character wants to do, and it used to feel kind of bad that the amount of the time you wanted to take Snekoi and the amount of time that you just died to Chosen Hallway Fight in Act 2 or Sneko Hallway Fight in Act 2 or Time Eater, or Choker, or something like that, meant that taking Prepared in Act 1 just felt wrong. But nowadays it feels right, which that is a nice thing about the balance, I guess. Yeah, I'm usually not taking Prepared in Act 1, unless I took an Eviscerate. But oh, I like two, Prepared I in Act 1. I, I just I sold the latter half of the run in a way that Prepared is good so much that the fact that it's like not great against Gremlin Knob just isn't enough to not take it anymore yeah that makes total sense but yeah that, that was just fun not a whole lot of strategy to talk about but super fun so second run of the of the sequence defect here defect was also super fun you were talking about um runic capacitor being one of your favorites on on defect how about runic capacitor plus frozen core from the first boss Ooh. So that I was getting free frost orbs every turn. I like never take frozen core. It's one of my it's one of my favorite relics design wise. I think it's really underpowered most of the time, uh, but does enable some really cool deck building. I like that it lets you have a deck that's just orb scaling and like attacks, and then all of the block comes from your free frost orb generation. Sure, and that's. That's not what ended up happening here. This run, this run was was weird. Um, something that that was quite notable. I I gave my very first attack card beam cell to Ranwid to get an old coin right at the start, and then because I was short a card, I ended up picking up Hello World on floor four, Hello. and that Hello World helped me get through Act One. I love it when Hello World does work. Yeah, yeah. And then this, this run turned super strong. We got Mummified Hand, um, Strange Spoon, Ritual Dagger. Oh, yeah. This was like a 100 Ritual Dagger damage run, too. That's very so cool. I think, I think I just stabbed the, the spear, Spire Spear. And this was also a run that upgraded all of its cards with Mark of the Bloom. Got like 20 free upgrades there. Also very cool. Yeah. So this was, this was a super strong So we effect. both had a Mark of the Bloom run. Yeah, at least yeah. one. I might have even had two. I'll have to look. Nice. Yeah, I like right. the the ritual dagger on defect for the Act Four Elite fight very specifically because I do feel like there are a decent chunk of defect decks which like 
cruise through everything in the game except for turn two and three of the act four elite and the hard fight yes and yes i have seen yeah. many 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 players on others other streams and even by my own stream defect runs that are so so strong and then they just fall completely flat in act four because they cannot yep. deal with the elites yep and ritual dagger is one way to do that and i mean i have designed the entire way i'm playing the entire character around that turn basically so yeah makes total sense this is also a run where i got a lot of use out of fission because once i got rid of the orbs they regenerated as free frost orbs kind of mm -hmm. cool for sure all right number three the watcher run you have a prismatic shard on Watcher, Baylor. Do we need to talk about I this? Have, I have two, two prismatic <laughs> shards on this win streak, actually. But, <laughs> but I assumed they were, like, not on Watcher. <laughs> is, it, isn't, is her card pool not strong enough for you, Baylor well, Lord? <laughs> meteor Strike is not a Watcher card. No, look at this run history. <laughs> I needed that Meteor Strike. It's, I, it gave me back four energy instantly. That is pretty good. Did you ever recycle the Meteor Strike? That's one of the like hidden synergies I really enjoy in this game. I'm, I might have. Yeah, yeah, I might have. Look at the, the run history. Let's see. This was... I did take damage to, to Heart. Shield and Spur was zero damage two turns, so I must have done something really good there. It is very believable that this deck could do something really good. There are quite a lot, a of, lot of very strong of cards in things. this one. I love that you have Exhume and Meteor Strike and Recycle, and then your silent card is like Acrobatics, and it's like, well, actually, yeah, that's about the same power level, <laughs> this like unupgraded common. That, that seems good, too. Yeah, yeah this, was, this was pretty busted. Uh, when did I pick up the shard? This was three? Yeah, it looks like sometime in Act 3. Back in the day... You were part of the charity week I ran back in the day where I had a different streamer on my channel with me every day and we were raising money for the International Medical Corps. Yes, yes. Oh my god, that was so long ago. I played a run with one of the streamers that week where we bought Prismatic Shard because um, we were on, I think, Defect with uh, Dead Branch and he was like, well, we have to try to get Dead Branch Corruption on Defect, right? And as we bought it, I was like, so just to clarify, do, do you think this is actually a good decision? And he was like, no, I would rather throw the gold away. <laughs> <laughs> We'd rather just get nothing for my gold. So. Oh, man. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I buy Prismatic Shard partially because it, it leads me to unique runs like this one. For sure. Runs that for I've sure. never had in 6,000 hours of play are only things I can sometimes acquire by buying the Prismatic Shard. Yeah. So I sometimes do it for that reason. And what I found is that it's, it's pretty fun. Um, it I think it's, it's, it's quite good if you've got an attack-based build of any kind on any character because of the cross-access you get to both Watcher stances if you're not Watcher or Strength if you are. Yeah. Um, and I think that if you have Question Card, it's actually secretly kind of good. Huh. The, the big thing... Question Card, Two, two things I'll point out with with Prismatic Shard that are, that are secretly really good. One, it adds colorless cards to the card rewards, which sure. are better on average than the, the regular cards. Mm -hmm. And fun little fact, this is the only way to see a randomly upgraded colorless card. You can get offered a, an upgraded uncommon colorless at random with the Prismatic Shard. Hmm. Yeah. yeah, I guess otherwise you need eggs. You need the egg appropriate otherwise. Because you won't get random upgrades in the Act 3 event. Um, the Sensory Stone. And of course the rare colorless cards, since they're rares, they can't be randomly upgraded either when you see them. Kind of unfair that the Sensory Stone can't randomly upgrade. I'd never really yeah. thought about that before, but it seems like it's a card reward, right? That card rewards are meant to have a chance of rares, or sorry, of upgrades. Sensory Stone doesn't. It's interesting that colorless cards have no commons, so if you have a prismatic shard and you're expecting to see tons of colorless cards, you actually still need to roll an uncommon or rare to have a chance of seeing one at all. Yeah, I think, I think you might be right. That's, now I'm wondering if, if it rolls 
rarity and then card or I, color? I'm pretty sure it rolls rarity and then it rolls all of the out of all of oh. the uncommons in the game, you know? It'll get yeah. one. I'm almost certain. All right. Well, I, I want to talk about this um this silent run next, actually, because this was this was a really or er, the... watch your ironclad. Silent oh. is after that. Ironclad next. Excuse me. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, gotcha. Skipping over a little bit. This was a boss swap. I've I've come around a little bit more to the boss swap, particularly on the ironclad. For a long I used time, to like boss swap on ironclad. Once upon a time. Yeah, for I I I've. I've waffled back and forth on it. I look at I look at the burning blood and I see it heals way over a hundred, and uh, I'm having a really hard time justifying giving that up in Act One. But I also feel like Ironclad can perform so much better with more energy. Yeah, turn. Ironclad has so many two cost cards and a two cost starter card. So yeah, and that's exactly what this what this deck did was is fill the deck with high cost cards and then use Velvet Choker. Excuse me. Don't even know where my phone is. Oh, I found it. Not to serve as properly on now. Anyway, so this um, we just talked about Demon Form with Velvet Choker Ironclad. That's uh, that was the star of the show here was Demon Form, plus um, Runic Pyramid Apparitions and Brimstone. So my my goal oh, was basically cool. be intangible for four turns and then Heavy Blade stuff to death with a bajillion strength. So it was you Vajra Demon Form team. plus Brimstone. That's the latest Brimstone I think I've ever seen. I've definitely won Brimstone runs, but it's been something that I've pushed into very early in like Act 1 sort of yeah, idea. Th this, was, this was an unusual Brimstone run. I, I don't usually pick it up without like a lot of feed HP or a disarm or two, but I, I figured the apparitions would be enough, and it, it worked out. Yeah. It's like... It is surprising how little it really matters for the enemies to get one strength a turn, with the exception of the heart's multi-attack, which, like, if you have apparitions at the right time, that's no longer a thing, so... Yeah. No problem. Easy. Easy, easy. The, um... Yeah, I used to think that there was somewhere between a 20 and 80% chance that it was right to be boss swapping on Ironclad uh, at the start of every run. Like, um... Not... Okay, I phrased that wrong. I used to I think, think that it was correct to boss swap an ironclad somewhere between 20 and 80% of the time, but that was my level of confidence, which is not high. I, Can you say that percent range again? You just cut 20 it and there. 80. 20 to 80. Got so it. I was confident you shouldn't never do it, and I was confident you shouldn't do it literally every time, but I had absolutely no confidence in between whatsoever. And eventually I just stopped boss swapping because I don't enjoy the runs very much. I find it like boring to play a broken pandora's box deck starting from floor one these days so i don't but, i can uh, see that yeah i can see that i can i can find a lot of fun in those runs but i could absolutely see how you might find them uninteresting especially if you thought they were like a foregone conclusion of some kind yeah they were fun for the first while but it, it was sort of like dead branch where like the first few times you get like dead branch corruption it's like oh this is really cool i'm so invincible i'm playing so many cards and then like the hundredth time you get it it's like i cannot possibly lose i am clicking cards for the next 45 minutes until i win which is clicky clicky yeah i mean i love this game i love so many things about this game it's just that one is one that i've gotten bored of yeah <laughs> so well, uh, let's talk about this next silent run then, because the silent was about the opposite of a foregone conclusion. All right. So, silent number five. Definitely one of the most memorable runs for me. So here's a pop quiz for you, Jorbs. Yes. You start out floor one as silent. You take a, a bonus that doesn't affect your, your starting combat. So it's, it's your starting deck against Jawworm. Okay. You draw. Yep. Three strikes, two defends. Survivor, Ascender's Bane on turn okay. one. Yep. And Jawworm is attacking for 12. What do you do? Basically, you have only three options strike, defend, survivor, strike, yep. strike, survivor, or three and strikes. The remainder of my deck is strike, strike, three defend. Is that correct? And neutralize. That's right. Or two defend. Strike, strike, two defend, here. neutralize. That's right. How much health does the Jawworm has? Uh. 49, let's say. 49. 
Can it have that high? I don't, I don't actually remember. I don't actually remember what the, the John Worm like health was for this fight. Was... Hmm. So I mean, the obvious options are Average. strike, strike, survivor, or strike, survivor, defend. This yeah. is the choice. And so the question is, am I spending four health to deal six damage there? Uh no, I don't think I am. I think it's just survivor, defend, strike for me. That's that's the choice I made, and that was the wrong choice. Yeah, that Did was you the very wrong choice. Sold it afterwards to confirm that it was the wrong choice, or so did what you happened get really was unlucky? that I drew neutralize, strike, triple defend during a buff turn three yep. times in a row, that... and I took forty-seven damage to this jawworm. That might on floor be one. like. That might just be what's meant to happen against Jawworm on floor one sometimes, though. <laughs> like, if you draw that badly, I don't, I don't think you have to beat yourself up for that. Because giving up four health, like, how likely is it you draw a triple defend neutralized strike three times in a row while it's buffing? It's, like, not likely, right? Not, not particularly likely, but there was an important heuristic that, that I learned in the aftermath of this run. Uh, it's... I'd call this sort of a, a minute improvement to my opening combat play. Okay. And the, the rule that I learned was that if, if Silent draws three strikes against Jawworm turn one with the starter deck, you must play two of them. This was articulated oh. actually to me by a chat member. They'd, they'd done some more crunching on it. But essentially, if you're missing too many strike plays, if you skip two strikes on turn one. What was... Did Silent. they solve that? Like, did they actually... Because people can solve floor one fights with starter decks at this point. Yes, I, I think I think the fight is solved for the lower ascensions where you don't have the ascenders bane. Okay. But with the ascenders bane and you have that like one extra card that gets cycled without being drawn, it gets really complicated and tough to solve. So, but... in that solution, are they like how are they evaluating taking forty seven versus taking four? How much worse is it to take 47 compared to how bad it is to take four? I think it's 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 gotta be that your odds of taking more than four are above 50%. I don't know how to articulate this mathematically. Well to the level of detail you'd like, I think. Yeah, because to solve eight. that situation, you have to solve Slay the Spire, which we haven't done. Because right. you're talking about very dis different distributions of damage. You're talking about taking four consistently versus sometimes taking tons, but sometimes saving four health. Um, and so that will like depend on pathing and stuff. I see in this run that you went to a store and got a Nilri's or a, a Lee's waffle or whatever it's called. Yeah, so I ended up I ended up buying a Lee's waffle on floor five, which yeah. brought me back up to full health. It and then... may be that the fact that you could go to a store on floor five changed what your line is meant to be on floor one of that fight. Because... Ooh. In the lines where you take forty plus, you have an out to full heal, and that's like I think it's probably pretty close. And the solution of the remainder of the game is probably significant enough to matter in a situation like that. Yeah, I believe that. I believe that we've worked out a way that your play was right. You can I like it? You can sleep well Thank at you. night. Our play, because you chose that line too, so we're both committed together that yeah. that was the correct play. The jawworm I, seems to have disagreed, but the jawworm's wrong. The jawworm's dead, and you won. Jawworm's yeah, I so, murdered that jawworm, yeah. and then I murdered the heart. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, and actually, so the other thing I, I, I want to mention with this I, run. Can I, I love that we talked about the turning the corner thing, where it's like, you just, like, you're falling behind an act two and everything, and, like, in this run, it was just floor one. <laughs> I'm just, I'm really falling behind against this jawworm. <laughs> I needed to turn the corner. <laughs> needed a way to catch up. Yeah. Yeah, th this run almost died several times. Let's see. I um, let's see, low health. I went to twelve health against Jawworm. I went. I lost forty health against Legavulin after buying the waffle, so I went immediately back down to half. I went to eleven health against Slime Boss. I went to fifteen health against Shield Parasite, and then nine health against Bronze Automaton. And then once I got to Act 3, everything was fine. Mostly. Yeah, had an easy heart fight because we got like tough bandages suddenly in Act 3 and that changed everything. But I almost died in Act 1 and 2. So the, the other thing I wanted to mention with this run is 
is sort of your your morale, your spirits, your mood. Mm -hmm. I actually started this run talking about how your confidence in your play affects your ability to actually succeed. Sure. And then I immediately run into a situation where I get completely obliterated by the first opening <laughs> of the game. <laughs> but, and I think uh, many people would be reasonably <laughs> justified in becoming infuriated at this point. <laughs> but oh. I, I managed to collect myself and just be like, okay, how do we, how do we you, move forward? Let's put that You committed to us. your the, rogue line of playing just, strike, defend, keep, defend, or strike, yeah. defend, survivor. Keep going. And decided to stick with it. You're, yeah. you're an experimental player, and you decided to take zero instead of four on turn one of the Jawworm <laughs> fight. Wrong choice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but next time I'll take the four, though. That's what I learned. Hmm. I don't yeah. know if I am convinced by our conversation that I would take four there yet. Well, I, I hope you enjoy taking 47 to Jawworm in the future, then. Yeah, we'll see. <laughs> What's we'll gonna see. happen to you? Maybe I need to run a like silent versus jawworm stream one day. Play the fight a hundred times. Just yeah, just just it's, <laughs> see what the best score the jawworm gets is. Funny. Yeah, how many times does it kill me? <laughs> <laughs> so funny. Wow. All right, we got a bunch more runs in this uh, in this streak to go through. Let's let's cross a few more off. So, moving on to uh, to the defect that came after this. This was this was a, a boss swap defect that got a very early toxic egg. Let's see, did that come from the chest or the first elite? The chest. So, toxic egg in the middle of Act One happened here, and that turned into forty card special, just like every card in the book. Uh, but notably, two meteor strikes. We're talking about the breakability of meteor strike. Funnily enough, neither from my boss rewards. First one. Hmm. Yeah, one. I also defects the other character that I have boss swapped on the most. I, I also think that defect boss swap is probably correct somewhere between some percent of the time and some other percent of the time. Losing the lightning orb definitely makes your act one elites a lot worse. Yes, Gremlin Nub especially, way, way scarier with a, uh, with a boss swap, and the extra energy doesn't always make up for it. Right. The biggest, biggest problem I have with the boss swap on defect is if you draw dual cast turn one, mm -hmm. it does nothing. Right. Yes, also Compile Driver um, gets much, much, much worse, which is ironic because your card draw commons are the things you want to be getting better if you're on four energy, but yeah. you've made Compile Driver worse. So, Whatever being a lot weaker is definitely confusing. On the other hand, Defect has a fairly significant pool of useful value cards that get better on four energy, stuff like Doom and Gloom and Glacier and Recycle, or uh, Reinforce Body, what I was trying to say, actually. Sunder becomes a lot better. Meteor Strike becomes a more present option. So there are lots of reasons to like the fourth energy. Yeah, a defect is, for me is a character that I don't find dependent upon energy relics because they have lots of cards that can make energy. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, they're very easily able to spend energy with many X cost cards that are good, many high cost cards that are good, and lots of card draw. Yeah. So energy is always welcome on the defect. Yep. And this run was, was certainly rich in energy. Triple heat sinks, double meteor strike is like so much fun. Yeah. yeah I didn't, didn't even. Remember the, the triple heat sinks. Uh, I remember like deliberately drafting these towards the late game as part of my draw engine. Yeah, this with, the where I did... with so many energy creating cards, you're going to be taking anything that draws you cards basically at that point. Right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's just like uh, whatever gets double meteor strike in play was kind of the line that I was thinking about with this one. Worked out really well. All right, Watcher. Watcher also had a big chonky deck 33 cards this was what was this cloak class wing boots first two relics into black star into having just a ton of relics is it a lesson learned that you removed is that how all the cards are upgraded um yes i removed lesson learned plus at floor 54 yes good question did you like watch runs like that 
Do you applaud somberly as it left the deck? <laughs> we just we give it a salute. Yeah. Its duty is done. Yeah, goodbye. Service has ended. Thank you, lesson learned. We we respect you as a card that has contributed to the deck, but do not grant you the title of winning run history inclusion. Oh, oh, this is this was actually the the run I was talking about. I'm sorry, it wasn't um, enlightenment. This was establishment. Establishment meditate is it? Meditate madness with triple wheel kick and sundial. Actually, I don't, do you have a meditate? Um. I don't think you do. No, I don't. It's like a naked establishment. What establishment even doing? Oh, it's making um, Sands of Time super cheap. Sure. That's what it's doing, I guess. That was a weird run. I like the like Sands of Time vault synergy, where the card is just like... You can make it work. I think it's one of Watcher's worst damage cards, which I feel is in the window of, I can work with this, but it's like right at the bottom. Um... It has cool interactions with like liquid memories, for example. And if you ever have an energy hmm. potion, like Sands of Time is a lot better in that situation. But then if you get like two volts in your deck, all of a sudden it's just genuinely pretty good. Um, I really like that about that card. Yeah, I, I, I really like early game Sands of Time. Can, can be a very nice act one solve, particularly for Gremlin Knob. Yeah. So good. Yeah, for sure. And I'll... Especially against Hexaghost, I feel like Watcher needs to be able to guarantee damage sometimes, and Sands of Time is really good for that play. Yes. It's good against Lagavulin. Like I said, it's good with many, many different potions. It's just like, I struggle to be excited about Watcher cards that aren't good when I'm getting attacked for 20 on turn 1 of Act 2. Yeah, it's, it's not a card that's good on turn 1, which of course yeah. makes it a little problematic. Yeah, so when possible, I try to make my cards as good as possible on turn 1. Right. So next run was Ironclad. This one was super easy. I boss swapped into Snack oh, Eye. Yes. And then went double bludgeon, triple demon oh, form. Yes. Double I whirlwind. Love, I enjoy <laughs> the, the bludgeon demon form synergy. I'm going to hit them for 42. No, I'm going to hit them for 45. <laughs> That's twice with double tab. Yeah. I love that. Bonk. Yeah, this was, this was super fun. And two heavy blades, too. Just like all the big blap cards and... Mm -hmm strength at the wazoo and just crushed everything to death. It was really, really good time. That two really, strength really ironclad decks was your... Yeah, the other one had demon form too. Demon yeah. form is 2-0 and o in this, well, kind of 4-0 and because you have three of them here. Yeah, uh, so part of the, or kind of parallel to the 20 rotating streak, um, this, uh, this ironclad and these ironclad wins were part of a 16 streak with that character as well that I ended up going to. Nice. Yeah, pretty that is, happy with that. That is excellent. So I had, a, I had a lot of success on Ironclad recently. And it's, I do feel like boss swaps were part of that. Yeah, it's really interesting that you're doing well with boss swaps. I had like an 18 and 2 little run with boss swaps on Ironclad when I was experimenting with it. But I don't know. I had a sequence of runs afterwards that didn't feel as good, and also I just started to get tired of boss swapping in general, so I stopped doing it. I completely understand. I've, I've moved back and forth on boss swap a lot myself. As occasionally, I'll challenge myself to like only boss swap for a month, and I have a lot of fun runs like that, but then I get sure. bored of it, and I decide not to boss swap for a while, and then yeah. I gradually work it back in again. I'm sure it's, I'll go back to exclusively boss swapping for a while at some point. Sure. It's... It's so hard to pin a number on like how percentage good it is, but it's it's definitely a way to vary it's, your play. It it might be the hardest thing in the entire game to confidently say the value of because wow. you're talking about the entire rest. So you have to, for me to say the value of something, I have to imagine. Okay, here's a question for you. If you have two strategies for a character, and one of them you lose 5% of your chance to win because of mistakes you make and win 75% overall, and one of them you lose 10% of your chance to win because of mistakes you're making, so you're making twice as many game-losing mistakes, and you win 72% overall, 
So you're making 5% more mistakes, but you're only losing 3% less. Which of those two strategies is better? Ooh. Huh. So it was 575 versus 1072? Yeah. Is that what you said? So if you could play without making mistakes, you'd win 82% with the one where you make more mistakes and 80% with the one where you make less mistakes. But you can't do that, and you know of no human who can do that. Right, but the break-even point is eight, reducing the mistakes by 80%. It's still probably yeah. almost impossible. Hmm. Hmm. We've gotten better at the game. Like, if you yeah. stuck at it for two years, you'd probably get there. Yeah, I'd say, I'd say the first strategy is probably better, but, like, over time, you tend yeah. towards the second strategy eventually overtaking it by a small margin. Yeah. I, I yeah. think that, like, the amount of complexity that's added to the game by changing your starter relic to one of like 20 different things or whatever, and some of them are like Sneko Eye and some are Runic Pyramid, and like they're very different from each other. I think that is a very large boost in complexity. So it leads to many, many more mistakes. Um, so even if it is losing compared to other strategies, if you stuck to it for five years, I think it would almost certainly get to a point where it's better more of the time than it is right now. That sounds right to me. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Silent run. Five of each in this 20 streak. That's pretty absurd. Let's see. This, oh, so this is the other Prismatic Shard run. I don't think it listed. Oh, there's 41 cards in here. I don't think it listed everything. Let's there's see. There's some off the bottom, yeah. Um, off the bottom is three copies of Footwork. Um, Those are important. Oh, yeah. Actually, there's a lot of stuff that you can't see that's very important. So four bite pluses and Jax plus. Ooh, Jax. Featured in this run. This was a Jax run and a cool one at that. So it was, it was using bites and Jax yeah. to win. Let's take a look. That's super fun. I, I did trade max HP for the bites. So we went down to 42 max HP. Picked Jax from the Jax dealer. The, upgraded the Jax. And this deck, this little deck also took 999 gold from the store. Cool. With membership card. Oh, nice. And then went to two shops. That's where I bought the Prismatic Shard, was once I had 999 gold. Sure. And you got an Iron Wave Plus, which is hilariously good. <laughs> this is maybe the best Iron yeah. Wave Plus I've ever seen in my life. It was with three footworks. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Iron Wave Plus is like... Very excited to be given this opportunity because it has never been given from it Jax before. Too. Yeah, yeah. I think yeah. I had like ten strength and ten dexterity in the heart fight or something ridiculous. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I took eight damage to heart over ten turns. I just bodied it with this weird forty-plus card prismatic shard deck, and as you can see, thirty-three relics. It was just like tons of everything happening mm -hmm. in this run. Very. Yeah, it's a black star run with membership card. Yeah. 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 I even went, I, guess you, I went two copies of well Aid Plans just for the redundancy. Mm -hmm. When you get a, a deck this size, the second copy can help a lot. Kind of like those two Corruption Ironclad runs. For sure. Very silly. Very, very silly. Um, how did this run even start? Hexagos? Oh, I bought like so many things in Act 1 even. Is First it a shop, gold I whale bonus maybe? Yes, I started with a lot of money. I rolled into the first shop with 500 gold and oh, bought nice. membership card, dagger spray, panic button. Sorry, dagger spray plus with molten egg, sure, panic button, yeah. backstab plus, and centennial puzzle. So I just got like oh, that'll kill some so stuff. many things in Act 1. And you got the bronze scales in the Echebeco already? Yeah. Yeah. It was ridiculous. It was a very fun run. All right, on to defect. Another boss swap here started with Velvet Choker and still decided that two Meteor Strikes was the correct amount of Meteor Strikes, despite the fact that I could only play um, six <laughs> cards. This is another, another Ruining some... Capacitor run, too. There's no multicast. There's one Reinforced Body. How much energy? You have a double energy as well. Do you have Calipers? No. How much no. energy did you end turn with in this run, do you think? Oh, I'm sure quite a bit. Yeah. 
I'm sure quite a bit. More or less than a thousand. Not a, not a thousand, but lots, lots, lots. What's really baffling me is the two storms and the static discharge. Are you trying like, to like work your way backwards? Is this like a memento situation where mm -hmm. you don't remember, but you have like little notes written to yourself and you're trying to piece it together? Okay. This yeah, is I, a... definitely, I definitely don't remember this run per se. So I'm trying to have a piece backwards what happened. It looks like I went it's down a... to two health against Dead Hexagos. Branch as well. So, I mean, Dead Branch makes everything even more weird, right? Yeah. Double bias cog, but no orange pellets and no core surge and no panacea. Is that correct? That's right. So That's you're right. No, playing no way to keep the, the focus. We just running out of focus. Yeah, I just had to end the fights before I died. Essentially, I did okay. Sure. I mean, sometimes meteor strikes good because it deals a ton of damage, which is really weird because it doesn't seem like that would be the relevant half of that card, but sometimes it is. Yeah. Yeah, 30 damage per card, it's it's important when you've only got six per turn. Yeah. And you have an echo farm, so you get to play that twice and get all of your energy back when the second one evokes all of the orbs, although you also have the runic capacitor, so sometimes you won't quite get that. Yeah, it's uh yeah. I feel like there are lots of defect decks where I just really want to have calipers, not because I need it or anything like that, but because it would be so good here. And like, so good. Echo form, double meteor strike, double energy reinforced body. I'm like, I'm looking at that deck list and thinking, God, I want to make 700 block and then not make block anymore for the rest of the fight. So bad. It just to sort this of day, one of, me. one of the no calipers. <laughs> easiest defect runs I ever had was calipers into four copies of genetic algorithm. Oh, yes. I very much enjoy those <laughs> runs too. Yeah. Did you get the echo farm in that one? I I don't I don't think that I did, but oh, I, I upgraded them all and by the middle of act two I was just like a hundred yeah. block. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Forever. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, watcher number three, I think. This was another fun uh, omniscience run. I think one of the one of the more breakable cards um on the watcher. Very much not a, an infinite, but a a divinity centric deck yeah double uh, devotion two double devotion double omniscience two praise card i don't often take all that much and a prostrate as well along with demaru so the mantra generation is absurd i was going divine every turn pretty much um and i've i've come to really like divinity as a way to generate energy on watcher late game if you haven't gotten a lot from relics so for example the the boss relics on this one were calling bell runic pyramid just three base energy per turn mm -hmm. but with divinity kicking in plus three your every turn it was more than i needed for sure your watcher decks are definitely engaging with the card pool a lot more than my watcher decks do which is what's the right word it's encouraging to see Hmm. I tend to build a lot of mantra-centric Watcher. Mm -hmm. I don't know that it's necessarily optimal, but it, it does work pretty well. Yeah, I mean, if it's fun, it doesn't matter if it's optimal. That's right. Um, yeah, for sure. Yeah. I've had, I remember in the 11 streak that I was talking about with you like two years ago, I had a deck that like Basically, I had to take a devotion very late, and I had double omniscience, and I had to get through the heart fight with like 30 cards in my deck, and I had to scry everything with third eye to get all the way back around to make sure that I could draw wheel or wallop rather the turn I entered divinity to be able to block the big attack, or else I was dead. And I like hit it, and it was like a one in 10 to hit it, or whatever. This deck reminds yeah. me of that, and like very cool ways and it makes me a little bit sad that i just don't really play decks like this on watcher anymore because i don't take most of these cards to put myself in a situation to do it devotion's a fun card yeah a lot of a lot of good times with it all right ironclad clad here talking about double uh double corruption double welly plans how about double barricade for redundancy in draw there. I like it. This one was um, 
One of my favorite early picks on Ironclad, first floor Blood for Blood going to Hexagos. Mm. I love Blood is, for Blood. Yeah, really, really solid alongside a, an early upgrade and the right boss. And then we got Pandora's Box and the Act 1 boss. I think that was where one or two of the offerings came from. And then it kind of built into this huge exhaust block synergy. You know, uh, power throughs and second winds and dark embrace and four, four copies of shrug it off with corruption just get a million block and then once all the skills are gone it all comes back down to that original blood for blood make it zero cost and play it over and over again yeah works yeah, really well I, I love i love ironclad's attack cards which are capable of dealing with like your act one elites but are also just capable of killing the heart um, which is like blood for blood and anger are kind of the two you can do that with because both of them scale yeah. so well off of um, card draw. Maybe Pommel Strike because of Sundial, but you have to get Sundial for that to be true. Yeah. And the one that's really good late game that I'm still trying to figure out how to use early game, Body Slam on Iron Club. Yes, Body Slam is very tough to take early, but definitely if you could, if you could like fall asleep through act one and wake up in act two with an act one deck that just hadn't had to take any damage cards in it yet you could add your body slam to it you'd generally be pretty happy yeah yeah you would um what do you think about shrug it off on like floor four in your hallway fight reward right now i'm generally. i'm pretty happy with one block card in the first three to four card rewards on almost any character Sure. So I, I'm happy with an early shrug or um, true grit. I think both are they help a lot against sentries, Lagavulin. They can be annoying against Grumlinna, but that's what your other three card picks and your potions are for usually. Yeah. So like if you can get away with it, it's it's good. Blo taking good early blocks is often a very valuable thing to get sort of ahead. You know, starting to kind of an act two card pick really. That's how I like to think of it. Yeah, most I, agree. Of the time. I agree. I've been more and more on Ironclad moving away from Shrug. I think because I'm more and more moving away from energy relics. Maybe. Hmm. I'm not sure I can quite explain why. I'm also like, I used to feel like I needed Shrugs to fuel corruption, and more and more I just don't feel like that's true anymore. I feel like I can do enough with corruption without needing the shrugs in the deck and so once i started feeling that way a lot of the a lot of the reason i was taking the shrugs was like i really want to make sure that when i get corruption i'll have fuel for it yeah. but i'm just getting more i don't know if i'm building the rest of my deck differently maybe but i'm i'm getting into situations where they don't seem like they matter as much and instead because maybe i'm not taking the fourth energy very often i'm finding that i draw them and i can't play them because if i draw corruption off them i won't have enough energy left to um play it hmm. very cool all right just if, i think we're about halfway through here let me see if i can go through the rest of these without too much more time spent oh wait so let's zoom silent once more See, this one was this one was tricky. So one of the questions I I kind of had for you today, and uh, I guess this one this run um, is a real highlight of how do you beat Act Four with Silent if you don't get any energy relics. Mm -hmm. This, this run had Nunchaku and Lantern to generate energy with, and that helped a bit. Does but Tactician that, count as an energy relic? Does Tactician count as an energy relic? I wouldn't, uh, wouldn't say it does. All right. But it's not a relic anyway, but it's definitely a way to, to win on base energy. Yeah. My answer is, I think in general, I've moved away from the idea that my energy comes from boss relics. And I've moved toward the idea that it comes from cards. So my answer is I put like tactician concentrate even out maneuver into mm, my deck mm -hmm. and I I build a framework for the deck that lets me draw and benefit from them. And adrenaline. I like I said, I take adrenaline over 
pretty much every other card on silent very consistently now. Yeah, I, I agree with that. For me, it's been uh, cheating energy where you can with stuff like bullet time. Sometimes madnesses can work too. Yep, I've been but taking just madness more often. Making sure to get energy upgrades where I can. Even those just one-time use energy upgrades. Looking at this deck, the upgraded cards, Malaise Plus, Phantasmal Killer Plus, Terror mm -hmm. Plus. Tools um, of the Trade Plus. Tools of Trade Plus. I, I took every minus one energy cost that I could yep. find because it was important yeah, to get every I, single card in play. I do that a lot too. Once you stop taking Sneko Eye regularly at the end of Act 1, it changes how you upgrade in Act 1 a lot. Yes. Yes, this this I've noticed. The more I the more I'm like, well, Sneko's not even that good compared to like, I'd rather have empty cage. So I'll upgrade Terror in Act One. Exactly. Yeah, and so there's like a massive swing. There are often massive swings in how strategy looks based on the change in your evaluation of one relic, where you do see Sneko at the end of Act One fairly often, and the fact that you're not really prioritizing taking it anymore means all of a sudden you can take the energy upgrades when you want them for everything else. And once you start taking the energy upgrades, now your fourth energy doesn't matter as much. So, Or your card draw cards are easier to pick. Yeah. That as well, because acrobatics is a lot better if you're drawing zero-cost things with it. So, yeah, yeah once you stop Twice. caring as much about Sneko, you also stop caring as much about fourth energy relics, just by nature of how energy is working for you in that run. Yeah. Yep, yep. Yeah. And ultimately, I think calculated gambles with uh, uh, tough bandages that we got at the very end was the saving grace for this one. That and over 100 max health, looks like. Singing oh, nice. ball is a ton. Calculative. Um, calculated gamble bandages is so strong. So filthy. So filthy. All right, tell me about defect. All right, I will. Yeah, this one was this one was fun. Is this the one I'm thinking about? Yes. This is the one. Like, right? We've got hologram recursion. Yes, with a recycle. So Oof, Darkstone Perry up to bottle the flame. Yeah, this Oof. was this was probably one of the hardest runs of my entire Slay the Spire career. I think this was the fourteenth run of the win streak. Yeah. I um, believe it. And I credit this run to what I call intuitive play, kind of like recognizing broader patterns on the defect and mm -hmm. understanding that I had to make some specific choices to have a chance of winning. And the, the choice I specifically credit with, make, with winning me this run is picking unupgraded recursion on floor 18 from okay. the two thieves. Okay. And then choosing to upgrade it at the next fire. Sure. At this point, I already had an all for one. Yeah, and I Doom and think Glenn. I had a hologram. And it turned out that that recursion, I think, was the only one I ended up seeing pretty much throughout the whole run. And my win condition ended up being to go infinite in this deck by using recycle to exhaust the deck down to. Recursion, skim, cool headed. Mm -hmm. And I used the, well, the plasma orb from the nuclear battery with the recursion to keep generating energy, the cool headed and the skim to keep drawing cards. Problem was that this doesn't generate enough block to, to bypass Heart's Beat of Death on its own. It also doesn't so deal damage, right? That's right. Doesn't do any damage either. Yeah. That's where that. That's where that. You see that one claw in oh. the deck. <laughs> oh, I, you're talking it up, and it, all it is is a claw deck, Baylor. It's just another claw deck. <laughs> so I, I couldn't get enough block without focus, mm -hmm. but my only focus was bias cog. Yeah, and I have no way to keep the focus. Yeah. So in the heart fight. I'm on a strict timer mm -hmm. for how many turn I have to go infinite by a certain turn number, but I'm also having to bloat the deck with cards in order to keep it alive in the short term. And I just barely managed to like thread the needle here in some how gnarly ways. How did your health go in this run? So 
Uh, let, let me let me read you a couple couple combat reports. The first big obstacle was Time Eater. Can't go infinite against Time Eater. Time Eater was 10 turns. I took 77 damage, oh, going no. from 83 health at <laughs> oh, full health, no. down to 6 health. Oh no. Then I went into Donu and Deka with 6 health, and managed to perfect the fight by going infinite. And that was okay. Yeah. I bought a fairy in a bottle at the shop in Act 4. I guess that was the best thing that there was, and removed Steam Barrier. That's funny. Took 24 damage to Shield and Spear over four turns. Remember I said bought a fairy in a bottle? Yeah. Corrupt Heart, nine turns, damage taken, 120 <laughs> out of 83. So you got the full, <laughs> the full value. Yeah, yeah I, I think I had like two hit points when I got clapped for 67 yeah. with the fairy. That's the dream. And then just barely managed to go infinite killing the heart on the last turn before my focus would have dropped to the point where I could no longer create block with my infinite combo. Yeah. So I, I be just barely managed to survive using every means at my disposal, just barely managed to get that infinite together, just barely managed to beat heart in one of the most nerve wracking runs of my entire life. Yeah. That's, that's really, really cool. I've had yeah. some defect runs like that. I actually had one. I had one where I like won at one out of 66 HP by taking between one and three damage four times to get a motion chip to give me output in the heart fight um, last night. And like, I think that I hear a lot of people being critical of defect because they feel like you just like make frost orbs and get focus and it's just sort of like that's just what you do. And on the one hand, like, yeah, of course, Defect has a character-specific mechanic, which a lot of the card bowl revolves around, like, yes. But on the other hand, I feel like when Defect's decks like that are challenged, they are so fun to play. They're so complicated. They're so rewarding. The way that Bias so Talk works, if you don't match it to an artifact charge, is so cool and leads to, like, it's just one of the most exhilarating feelings in Slay the Spire when you're in the heart fight and your focus is ticking down every turn. And the heart has 800 health. Yeah. You yeah. got you to gotta choose what, what turn do I play it on? Do I play mm -hmm. it right away? Do I play it later? Yeah. That, do I not play it at all? That so. terrifying, sinking feeling of looking at bias cog in your hand on turn one and thinking, if I don't play this right now and I die on turn three, I am going to feel awful. <laughs> yeah. But also, yeah. how do you make that decision right now? You have to think eight turns into the future or something. Yeah. yeah, it really requires a lot of um, being able to foresee how to, like, how, how the fights are going to play out and, and finding some answers there. For so sure. part of the reason the time eater fight went so badly in this was that I, my focus dropped into the negatives. I had orbs with zeros on them mm -hmm. and the, staring down the time eater. Um, the darkness plus in the very bottom left corner was a card I drafted before time eater specifically to give me an answer to that fight. That and it's the sense. only reason yeah. I survived at all. Did you manage to dual cast it? Yes. Yeah, I do, I do. I recursioned it a few times, even to the point where it was it was no longer growing at all. It was just a, a fifty damage dark orb that I just oh like recursioned gosh. a couple times and oh then dual gosh. cast. Wow. <laughs> yeah, it was super scary. Would you say that that time eater fight or the jawworm was more threatening to your streak? Oh, I think the time eater fight was. I was okay. losing it in that time eater fight. I think I might I might be on the side of Jawworm still, but I just am a big Jawworm fan. Who isn't? You know. <laughs> <laughs> I think the other thing that's notable about this defect run is the low relic count overall. It's just sixteen total relics. It's one of my yeah. lowest of the streak. That is very understandable after you get Darkstone Perry up and Bottled Flame because you're just you know you're going to be struggling the that run. Top. But then the unceasing <laughs> top. <laughs> Yeah. The unceasing top actually did draw me quite a few cards. Towards I believe the end. it. Yeah. You've got a decent number of zero costs in there. Yeah. All right. So uh, just six more then. This was towards the end. The next Watcher run was pretty, pretty easy. Ooh, Dead Branch Watcher. Dead Branch Snekawai. Dead Branch Snekawai Watcher? Yeah. I have never played a deck like this in my life, I don't yeah. think. Yeah. Vault Double Wish. 
Um, actually, oh, oh, this was cool. This was fasting. Uh, sorry, orange pellets. Snack a yeah, dead branch pellets, watcher. Fasting, double fasting. So I was always, almost always purging the confusion debuff on turn one, and then just drawing oh. a ton of cards. Huh. That makes with sense. With and yeah. using enlightenment plus. That's where the uh, that's the enlightenment plus run that was actually good because it was purge confusion snack OI enlightenment plus. So seven sense. cards per turn, make them all cheap, play them. It's pretty cool. Pretty cool. Yeah, watchers. Not a whole lot else to... Watchers very capable of going infinite, but also very capable of winning without doing that. And this is a great yeah, example I, of. I, a I think Watcher is one of the best Snacko characters. Period. She's got oh so many gosh. good high cost cards. I think so. Here's my problem: is that I think Snacko I wins like. There's a cap on how often Snacko I wins because once you make all of the zero cost cards in your card pool very bad, your card rewards just cannot be above a certain level of good because there are too yes. many bad the, cards you, on them. You kind of limit your card pool when you take Snacko I, of course. Yeah, and I just think that you don't get a playable deck with Snacko I too often on Watcher for it to be good. Like, when you do get the playable deck, I agree that, like, yeah, Omniscience is pretty good with Snacko I, obviously. <laughs> um, and so is Wish and so on. But I just think that you get the unplayable stuff 5 to 10% of the time even is all you need for it to no longer be appealing. Hmm. Yeah, I can I can see that. I can see that. Well, speaking of Sneko Eyes, the next Ironclad run is also a Sneko Eye. Quite a few Sneko runs. Kind of to counterpart your Pyramid. I didn't see Pyramid all that often in this win streak, but I did see a lot of Sneko Eye. Sure. Um, Ironclad here. This was... What I would describe as a somewhat standard um, corruption dark embrace run. Get the get all the powers in play. Do a lot of stuff. We had 150 max health with feed. Yeah, Sneko works so well with corruption dark embrace. Yeah, you got the Sentinel plus in there. Yeah, shout out to double dark shackles plus for really doing a lot. Card is very good. Yeah, yeah, just lots of lots of really good skills with corruption. Of course, making a good and abuse of corruption. Damage here Nikolai. is your damage here is basically just like double uppercut heavy blade. Yeah, yeah, with spot weakness for strength. Yeah, and and flame is in there. Yeah, yeah, yep. for sure. Yep, nothing too remarkable about this one. I wouldn't say. The next silent run, kind of similar. There's uh, some more conventional strong stuff here. Um, early toxic, first relic pocket watch. I remember taking it from Niao into first uh, next relic uh, toxic. Do you egg think that's the there. best turn zero in Slow the Spire? I think that's the best floor zero in Slow the Spire. Pocket watch? Yeah. Hmm. Helix is a pretty good contender too, but I, I think pocket watch is, is easily top five for sure. Yeah. Of starts, barring like really good high roll boss swaps. And stuff like that. Like Helix a, a, is an interesting contender. It's very good in a lot of the Act 1 fights. And at the start of Act 2. And obviously yeah. at the end of the game. Yeah. Yeah. And there's Burner is arguably too, because you set it up for a lot of stuff throughout the run. It's also exceptional. Uh, I've had a lot of fun with Prayer Wheel starts, but those aren't like instantly broken the way the Pocket Watch is. Pocket Watch is just like Act 1 is free. Yeah. You draw eight cards per turn. Prayer Wheel. It's very hard to compare Prayer Wheel to Pocket Watch because they lead to sort of exactly opposite decks. Kind yeah, of. they do. Yeah. Yeah. All right. And this is the last set of you. Last defect run. This was a huge defect deck. 40 cards. What on earth? Two Echo Forms. One of which was Bottled. Oh, nice. Gambling Chip. Lots of orb cards and powers. You got the anchor. Yeah, you have a really good turn one. Defect decks, which get to like bottle the Seeker Echo form and have like an anchor, are just going to win, basically. Oh my god, I had the sickest defect today um, on my stream. It bottled Seek with Necronomicon Hyperbeam. Hyperbeam killed everything. What was the time on that run? 
It's like it was actually it was about an hour. Okay. Didn't end up. I it was going fast initially, and then I slowed down at the end. I played a thirty-seven run Ascension twenty heart kill on stream the other day. Oh, no. I've been as so something I've been doing uh, recently on stream is is picking up the pace of my play, trying to get faster wins. Sure. And I've had some really good, really good speedy runs. We had a sub thirty minute ironclad run. Oh wow. Twenty six minute watcher run. Oh wow. And a thirty seven minute silent run that I was very proud of. Yeah, I've definitely like never catalyst. deliberately tried to play fast. So for me, when I got 37 minutes, I was like, wait, what? Yeah. Because I, I remember sitting and thinking for like two or three minutes multiple times in that run. <laughs> like, <laughs> but sometimes Watcher just has tantrum and shuriken and rush down, apparently. And ridiculous. Yeah. Everything ridiculous. dies very fast. You're like Omni Ragnarok. It's my other favorite kill everything turn one with Watcher. I definitely have played that deck. Yeah, that one's fun. Yeah. Yeah. Anything else that was really special about this defect? Seemed like a pretty mundane act one. Early data disc is nice. I almost died to Guardian. Of course I did. Guardian. Guardian, man. <laughs> and then Guardian almost got me on the Ironclad run afterwards too, right? Yes. For that. All right, last two. Watcher was number 19, I think. And then Ironclad was 20. That's right. So watcher, watcher number 19. This one was another very common theme here, all the fully upgraded watcher decks, courtesy of Lesson Learned. This was another remove Lesson Learned in, in Act 4 deck. Mm -hmm. Two Scrolls, Vault, uh, Kunai, Pandora's Box, just like lots and lots of strong stuff in this one. Um, looks like we were going Divine. Yeah, I had uh, Devotion, Brilliance, two Prostrates. So this deck was was doing divinity things occasionally. That was fun. Is the brilliance an early addition to the deck, or is it like after the devotion you added it? I believe it was after the devotion. Let's see if I can find it here. Pretty late. I always wondered about brilliance because it... To me, it's like the opposite of Predator, where Predator has two different things which give it good reasons to be picked at different times, whereas... I feel like with Brilliance, it has two different things which make it not very good <laughs> at different times. Yeah, like in Act it's 1... It's often, often overkill. In Act 1, it feels like it doesn't do enough damage, and in Act 3, it deals like too much damage. Is how I often feel with Brilliance. Hmm. Yeah, I can see that. Can't find where I picked it up. It's funny. I want to say it was after the Devotion. Okay. Yeah. The singular unupgraded wallop just sort of sitting there, like, <laughs> sadly, looking at every sadly. other card in the deck. You have a pendant <laughs> for it, too. It's, like, so ready <laughs> yeah. to go. I, re I, I had the chance to upgrade it, but I removed Lesson Learned at the final shop. I was like, nope. Oh. Every card but one for this Poor run. Wallop. Sorry. Poor wallop. Sorry, wallop. Not, not you today. Not you. Chemex for what is Chemex uh, doing in this one? Was there a? Oh, I think it was because um, it was to play cards from Dead Branch. <laughs> oh, you have a Dead Branch again? <laughs> yeah, there's a Dead Branch in here. Oh, yeah, okay. yeah. This was a Dead sure. Branch, definitely creating a lot. You do of have things. a so collect I, I... plus. Oh, there was a collect in here. Yes, this uh, Dead Branch ice cream and Chemex is why there's a collect. Yeah, uh, that's a really that cool little synergy. Good. I like. Mm. I have a lot of respect for collect. I think that, like, people look at Deva Farm and they're like, "This is a slow card that can sometimes be applicable for fights where I need to make a lot of energy later on." But I think like collect does that too, and often it does it actually faster than Deva Farm does. So, I have a ton of respect for that card as an option in the runs that need it. it it does some cool things i have a fundamental problem with it as an x cost card because it's not an x cost card like all the others where you want to put as much energy in as possible sure there's actually only a very specific amount like you don't want to play collect for 20 because you're right you have to wait 20 turns to yeah, get your energy and i've definitely had viewers be like shouldn't you have played the unupgraded miracle to play collect for one more and it's like well no i i need like three miracle plus i don't need four right yeah 
And then like sometimes it makes hand size issues. That's weird too. That is, yeah, a really weird thing about retain in general as a mechanic on Watcher is the hand size stuff. Yeah. But yeah, this was a, a fun penultimate run of the of the streak. All right, last one. Ironclad number 20. Again, we had a lot of demon forms in this uh, streak for me. I didn't, another hadn't another demon that. form, Yet another... Sneko, Fiendfire. Demon form, Sneko. I think I haven't seen many Fiendfires. Fiendfire, Sneko, I was one of my favorite Ironclad synergies. Yeah, especially with two Feel No Pains to make oh, all yeah. the block forever. Oh, yeah. And then this was just like... Heavy Blade Whirlwind with the strength. Other than that, let's see. We had a feed, so this run ended with 118 max health, and it was one of those runs where we actually had to use them all. It took 133 damage to the Corrupt Heart. Oof. And uh, yeah. did I revive or something? Yeah, mm -hmm. where's the heal from? Carrying a bottle, I had maybe? Magic Flower. I was definitely healing from something. Regen Pot, perhaps. Yeah, because I don't see it in the yeah. cards. There's no Reaper or Bites, right? No. Yeah, I think it was a Fairy Bottle, maybe. <laughs> oh yeah, I bought I bought a Fairy Bottle on floor 36, so I had a Fairy for the hard fight. I must have used it. Two relevant Fairy in a Bottles. You love to see yeah. it. Yeah, that's cool. Cool. Fairy, this was Fairy in a Bottle with Magic Flower and 118 Max Health, too, so it was like a big heal. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Have you ever had the uh, Sacred Bark as well? Or it's just like, yeah, sacred I have bark full magic. health now. 90% <laughs> of your health. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Great. Yeah, this was, this was a beauty. So, so Demon Form with, uh, with Sneko Eye was, a, was a, a reliable strategy for me. It's not, mm -hmm. a, not a card I like all that often, but... Yeah, when you get the worked. speed to have a little bit of extra health pool, especially if you can add a Reaper, which I think you got a bit unlucky to... I don't think you had. You've had a lot of strength on Ironclad, but I haven't seen many Reapers. And for me, I no, not very Reapers. many Reapers during this streak. One of the main payoffs for having strength. Yeah, especially if you've got max health like this run did. Yeah. yeah. Nope. That's definitely a synergy space on Ironclad that I used to spend a lot of time in. The feed plus Reaper plus strength type of thing, and I haven't been finding myself in it as much. I always felt like it was that versus the exhaust stuff, and obviously there's interplay between them, but deciding how I wanted to deal damage was always the interesting thing, and eventually I decided that it was more... It took more cards to deal damage with strength than it took to deal damage with exhaust, so I mm -hmm. tended to favor the exhaust stuff just because I didn't need to spend as much gold on cards or um, take as many card picks toward dealing the damage. Yeah, damage on Ironclad is weird. You've got like... It, it exists, I think, very very much independent of block, usually. Mm -hmm. You can either do the, the strength and strength scaling attack stuff, or if you're doing exhaust, you can uh, try to cycle one good attack over and over again, either play yeah. like lots of angers, or using a blood for blood over and over, or a body slam over and over. Yep. Or you can try to do infinite Lash with like a strike drop kick. kick. Yep. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Ironclad more than any of the other characters, it feels like there are a lot of turns where you are choosing to spend four energy on damage or block, and you don't really have much more than that that you can do. Whereas other characters, it's like you're going to leave orbs in play, or you're going to enter wrath and kill everything, or whatever. The other characters feel like they do things more incidentally than Ironclad, who feels like he has yes, to do things kind of deliberately. Yeah, Big agree. Damage while blocking, sort of. Mm-hmm. Flame Barrier is one of my favorite Ironclad cards because it's one of the few cards where it's like, I am doing one thing I need to do, and incidentally, I'm also achieving another one. Yes. Damage damage and block at the same time. It's beautiful. Yeah. And it, it scales so well. And, and it's got such a satisfying noise, too. If you've got Those... the bronze scales and the flame barrier. Yeah. I don't listen so to game sounds while I'm playing anymore, but I, I still remember the that is one of the best noises in the game. <laughs> Right, and then the final run, the one that lost, was Silence. The 21st run. This was yet another Sneko deck. This one finally betrayed me. You were saying Sneko has a, an upper cap yeah. on how often it can win, and I, th I think that was kind of at, at show in this run. Um, Sneko, I definitely made it challenging 
there were a lot of turns where I had to make very difficult choices because all my cards were very high cost. And it felt like because my cards were, my card pool was limited, I had to skip a lot of cards that I didn't want to skip. Um, and ultimately not able to, not able to quite piece it together. Although I was able to limp all the way to act four. And I, I even had a chance to win right up until the very end. I think I died with a heart at like a hundred health in this run. Mm -hmm. um, so it was a really scrappy run. And I think it made a very satisfying conclusion to the win streak, but couldn't quite get there. Alas. Do you feel in general that your losses are more satisfying than they were like two years ago, Sai? Sorry, can you say that again? You, you Do you feel in bit. general that your losses are more satisfying than they were, say, two years ago? My, do I feel in general that my losses are satisfying? I'd say I'd say a good good portion of them are. Not all of them are, but um, I I'm always satisfied when a, a loss had a chance to win. Like especially if the loss was yeah. in Act Four and I didn't get like completely wiped by the elites, for example, I, I made it to the heart and I had yeah. a chance to win the heart, even if it was a slim chance. I'm always happy with that, um, and I'm also happy with losses when. I feel like there's a lesson to be learned or a mistake that I can point to for sure that contributed to it. Um, and I'd say that happens most of the time when I lose, not, every, not every time, but most of the time. Yeah. I, I feel like a lot of my losses recently, and maybe this is variance, maybe not. I don't know. Um, I feel like a lot of my losses recently are that I am trying to pilot a strategy I like, and I have a fairly good idea of what its weaknesses and strengths are. And I understand that I have to take some risks and I take that risk and I get unlucky and I lose. And it's like, this should happen sometimes. That's like reasonable. I feel very like confidently oriented in a loss like that where it's like, yes, I understand why this happened. I don't think that I made a ton of mistakes. I, it reinforces my belief about the game basically. Whereas I feel like two years ago I would lose and I'd be like, well, I just like didn't see any playable cards, didn't get a potion, and died. So right, you're like, there's nothing I could have done. Yeah, exactly. I, I think those are those are much fewer and far between these days because yeah, you agree. either see the problem coming further ahead of time, so you take steps to avoid it. Um, you understand more options because you've tried more things. You've seen new ways to get out of fights. Um, and just more experience overall gives you yeah. more. I think it, solving power. a decent amount of it is my mindset. So moving into like the other questions that I had for you, I think I'm actually I'm not going to go in order. I guess because one thing that has changed a lot about my mindset in runs is I'm thinking a lot more about the last half of my runs than the first half these days. And when you when you asked how have you changed early Act One, which I feel is a sort of similar question. Um, one thing that I'm doing early Act 1 is I'm trying to make sure that the way that I'm setting my deck up to beat Act 1 transitions very easily into the way that I want to win the rest of the run. And I used to... I used to be like a leaf floating on the wind or something when I was playing Slay the Spire where I would be offered cards and I'd be like, this is the card that I need Going to take to get through the next thing sort of idea. And my belief as I was doing that was basically that the next few floors are very threatening. I will lose a lot of runs in Act 1. I will lose a lot of runs in Act 2. And that was true at that time for that balance patch with the cards at the strength that they were at. Um, but increasingly, my belief as I play a Slay the run, Spire run is like, I should comfortably beat Act 1 or beat Act 2 with better than 10th percentile luck. Basically, as, as long as things are going okay, I should be pretty able to comfortably beat these things, which means I can be pickier and I can start asking myself questions like, do I think that the strength synergies on Ironclad or the exhaust synergies on Ironclad are easier put, to put together to like beat the late game stuff? And I think the last time that I had a really big win streak, which was only earlier this year, so not that long ago, I went 30 runs where I made it to the heart every single run. So I was like not losing in Act 1 or 2 at that time. And my reaction to that, you might think that's like, oh, that's awesome. So you must have like 
you really nailed down the act one and two. So I bet you like never lose there anymore. You always make it to the heart. But my reaction to that was actually to observe that I was dying to the heart, but not dying earlier. And in the last um, like 60 runs I've played, I have only died to the heart one time now. Like all of my losses have been in act one and act two yeah. because I swung to the other side where it's like, okay, I'm going to play act one and two like they aren't scary to make sure I can win the end game yeah, if I'm completely... going to see evidence they're not killing me, you know? Before you clearly weren't getting strong enough for act four, so you have to change your behavior to yeah. get more power early on. Yeah. And that might mean dying more, but it could mean winning more overall too. Yeah. So my answer to like, how have you improved your play for early act one is I've gotten worse at it, <laughs> actually. <laughs> you um, started playing more, more aggro. I could see that. Yeah. Yeah, uh, that's... And there's so always I, I guess, calibration to do there. Like, I'm not going to claim I have it all worked out, but work in progress. Yeah, I, I think my own mm, optimizations in that regard, I talked a little bit about uh, a jawworm, you know, that, that little rule I learned. If you yeah. draw three strikes, you have to play two of them. I'm not going to forget that. And there's a couple other little, like, optimizations I found. Like, um, if you get a 29 health medium slime on Ironclad, then you want to bash strike the medium one rather than killing the small one. I like that line Sometimes. a lot. That's a cool line, yeah. Yeah. And then otherwise in Act 1, um, I guess sort of going into you know, another question about commons, um, defining, redefining the commons that I'm willing to take or willing to take often on each character has helped a little bit for me. Okay. Uh, on Silent, I feel is, like is where I made the biggest changes. What's your um, most important comment on silent? My most important comment on silent these days, I want to say is backflow, actually. Okay. And I, I've, I'm hearing a lot of praise for acrobatics from other players. And I'm I into completely acro. agree. Totally into acro. My feeling is that backflip is acro that I get to take in act one and it still uses my energy to, to output numbers sure. while I'm drawing cards with it. So it ends up, it ends up being this thing that scales with dexterity that's good later on, but it's, it's card draw that is also a, a block. And that's actually really, really nice. Okay. And yeah. then the other one that I'm really liking on common, uh, on silent as a common, is dagger throw. It's an, or an early attack card. Mm -hmm. And it enables all so the much. discard stuff, yeah. Exactly. It enables all the discard while doing a little bit of damage at the same time. Oddly enough, one of my, uh, in terms of run data one of my highest performing commons on the silent go figure yeah it's like 80 percent of my wins that i pick a dagger throw i win oh huh. i stopped looking at that stuff but i should do another one of those yeah. those videos i, I think where there's I a lot of those things are cool false conclusions you can arrive at if you take it too very literally. much it sort of tells you what you're doing rather than telling you what you should be doing yes yes yeah. yes exactly um so for me with acro so there are two things with acro. One is I've always loved playing acro. Like way back in the day, I spent a month just trying to turn one kill every enemy on silent uh, mm -hmm. when it was not correct, but I just loved doing it. And I always loved the part of the silent run where I got to start taking acrobatics. And for a long time, I thought that was the middle of act two. And for, I think a lot of patches, it's true that it was. But so I do this... You know how in chess puzzles, the fact that there's a solution makes you look at the game so you can find the solution? Do you do chess puzzles at all? I've watched a few of them. Okay. Um, channels like Frag and Chess Network, but I, I don't play a lot of chess stuff myself. Yeah, yeah, I'm familiar with puzzles and chess. Yeah, There's a really interesting mental thing where when you're playing a game of chess, you won't necessarily find a tactic, but when you are shown a chess position and told there's a tactic, you'll find it. And... With Silent, part of the reason that I started taking Acro all the time was just that I like thought it was good. But another part of the reason is that I saw that people were doing really well on Silent, and I was just like, oh, I guess Acro must be good now. <laughs> like, to me, that was just the only possible way that results that people were starting to have on Silent made any sense. And so I started playing with Acro. I still haven't like watched a ton of other people's runs on Silent at all. I don't gen like I generally like developing strategies on my own. But to me, if people are like winning 75% plus of their silent runs, like acrobatics has just got to be a good card. The 
it doesn't make sense to me that there's any other way that that could be happening. So that was yeah. sort of a, it was weird to like mentally process the fact that that was why I was choosing to do the thing I was doing because I like to develop strategies on my own, but also I have a large logical brain that's trying to solve Slay the Spire and using all of the evidence that it takes in to do so. So that was where I went. What about Ironclad Defect Watcher? Just like if you had to name one common that was the most important to see in Act 1. So for Ironclad, kind of similar to Silent, card draw is, is absolutely essential to get where you can. And I feel like Pommel Strike ends up being the Ironclad early answer, the one of one of the best damage commons for me to find. Sure. Um, whether you end up upgrading it or not, it's also sometimes part of an infinite if you go sundial with exhaust which is quite nice yep um i'd give a shout out to anger as being also very exceptional in the common pool for ironclad um and i think i'd rank those higher than like true grit or shrug or any of the other yeah. commons true grit went massively down in my estimation when i started valuing card draw higher because once you value card draw highly like second wind and sever soul and fiend fire just do it better than True Grit does, you know? Did you just say Sever Soul does a better job than True Grit? Yeah. Yeah, I, I like it. Yeah. Like, Let's get some Sever Soul admirers in here. I think it is true. <laughs> if you're taking Burning Pact in Act 1, like, if you're taking Offering over almost every other card to get to a, that point. I had a 5 Offering Ironclad today. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> did you have any exhumes I, I, no i i was actually exhausting them all with burning pack because i, <laughs> yeah, I believe it i believe it <laughs> that makes sense <laughs> <laughs> it was like how how few of these can i play each fight <laughs> for me on ironclad it's anger it's just anger, anger. like yeah just anger i'm not boss so many, though so so many runs wait off the back of just like play anger a billion times with four points of strength and just and it's clobber if you take the ironclad starter deck and you add an anger to it the deck just gets so much better the ironclad yeah, starter deck draws too much energy worth of cards to play every turn and has vulnerable in it and anger loves that so yeah it's it, it practically double the damage output of bash and mm -hmm. it just gets better and better the more you draw it yeah yeah it's really good how about defect Defect. Um, for me and my personal playstyle, I think the two commons that matter the most are the card manipulation commons, hologram and rebound. Sure. Uh, to the extent that I actually like both of these as a floor one pick because okay. both of them open up so many other options at floor two. Like picking claw on floor one is a bad idea doesn't go out very off well for you very say that often. quietly <laughs> but if you pick hologram and then pick claw it actually goes pretty well because you can play the claw two times per deck cycle sure um and that's true of quite a few cards streamline is something i've i've really come around on on defect speaking of commons mm -hmm. um, by playing it two three maybe even four times per turn if you can line your manipulation stuff up well but it, it's ultimately all about getting your best card on defect or, or your best cards and giving yourself repeated access to that. So having one hologram or one rebound lets you start breaking open a turbo or a skim or any abusable zero cost card or anything like that. Uh, yep. And I, I've had many, many, many runs win off the back of this. Yeah, that all makes sense. I am in a completely different place, but that all makes sense to me. Yeah, you're going you're gonna to say what a uh, compiled over cool headed, right? Yeah, which I, I already said that earlier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For me, and I totally respect that too. For me, the strong defect cards are like defragment and recycle and the things surrounding them. Like these are the ways you like go infinite or generate so much passive block every turn that you can't die and so on and so forth. Or fission, like I said earlier, um, that further accelerates. And so for me... I wouldn't want rebound on floor one because I've had too many losses to rebound putting a card on top of my deck and then I'm one less card mm. toward drawing my defragment, basically. Yep. Um, which is just a different 
way of prioritizing the cards. It's not necessarily like one is better than the other. And if the game is balanced well, which is definitely an if, <laughs> but I think Slay the Spire is like somewhat balanced well, right? I would yeah, if, if the game is balanced. Yeah, I would say that like both of these strategies could easily be within a standard deviation of as good as each other. So it's very possible that no human could ever prove that one was better than the other. And I think that's a really beautiful potential yeah, and it could thing also be for the game. My strategy works better for me and your strategy works better for you. Also, yeah, because we're more familiar with the synergistic space that we're within, you know, like human yeah. players are imperfect and that's a really important thing to recognize. I feel like one of the reasons that I don't talk a ton about strategy for Slay the Spire is that viewers are really into maybe not even deliberately but maybe accidentally pitting streamers against each other where they're like well Baylor Lord really likes taking this card on watcher why don't you do that do you like think he's bad the sort of idea like that's their conclusion where you have to understand that like we are imperfect humans and we're used to certain things and capable of piloting different decks in different ways and so we're doing what makes sense to us whether for our win rate or for fun or for interest, like or for learning new things or whatever. It's not necessarily a statement about like this is the right way and this is the wrong way. There are lots of ways. There are many ways. Yeah. Um, there was one other thing I was gonna say about wind chants for different commons, but I Oh, I think I was gonna say like I've always felt like Defect is the most able to take a damage card or a defensive card or a scaling card on floor one of any of the characters. Cause I think that's I think that's true. I think Defect can very easily get away with block. I, I love floor one charge battery. Yeah. Yeah. Even it's steam quite good. barrier sometimes can be quite nice. Auto shields, easy. I'll take that. Yeah. And I definitely don't say feel the same way about like silent, for example. I would not take a like I'd take a really good block card on Cylon on floor one, maybe, but I wouldn't take a mediocre one. Don't catch Jorbs taking dodge and roll into... Yeah, I would not take dodge and roll on, on floor one. <laughs> um, and with Watcher, I feel like I just want a damage card on floor one, and I almost don't even want a scaling card. Like, I almost don't want Rushdown on floor one as Watcher. And Yeah, with... you want your floor one card reward on Watcher to be remove defend. Yes. <laughs> yes. And then get a smite. Um... <laughs> And then who's the other one? Ironclad. Ironclad can sort of do all three. Ironclad's got fun options on floor one. Yeah. I feel like I, I least often go block, but like I'll take an inflame or a sometimes feel no pain or dark embrace or combust or there's lots of powers you can take floor one as clad. For sure. Talent size. Yeah. I have taken shrug floor one as ironclad in my life. For sure. I think I do it less now than I used to. Taking Flame Barrier floor one is Ironclad. I like early Flame Barrier. Yeah. Even on three energy, it's such a value card. For sure. Uh, okay, so that was Defect. Most important, watch your commons. Watch your commons. Um, or common. Hmm, it's a little tougher. I like the zero cost watch your commons a lot. Consecrate for the AoE. Very, very good upgrade, especially. And Prostrate is one of the best Divinity entry cards. Um, on floor one. Not necessarily on floor one for Prostrate, but it is it is takeable early. Okay. Uh, I will take Consecrate floor one pretty happily. Yeah. Um, other things that are okay, I don't know, Crush Joints, Sash Whip. But mostly I'm looking for Uncommons on Watcher, it feels like. Not that many Commons that I like. Yeah, I didn't have a clear answer to this question when I asked it of myself, because I feel like Watcher wants uncommons and like two rares um yeah i think i am usually looking for a bit more damage early on on watcher and i think empty fist is quite good at that yes i also yes. quite like crescendo um because one of the fail conditions of watcher is having an 11 card deck and having your 11th card be eruption against gremlin knob yes or or lagavulin i've seen Yes. Many disastrous Lagavulin fights yep. if Eruption is stubbornly just like... Yeah, you can draw drawn against Lagavulin for sure. ...on the first of the two attacks each time, and then Vigilance doesn't show up, and you just can't do anything. Yeah. There was a conversation I had with Terrence once where he just like very casually said, like, 
And you have to value this card highly as your second way into Wrath as Watcher. And I don't even think he was talking about Crescendo. He was just like saying, in general, when you're off of your second way into Wrath on Watcher, you should just take it. Because so many of your loss conditions on Watcher in Act 1 are drawing Eruption in the wrong place. Yeah. Which makes a ton of sense to me. Indignation much on Watcher, the Wrath Voln hybrid? Yeah, I like Indignation even in Act 1 um, because entering Wrath is enough. And because often it's a useful solution for Hexaghost, uh, it's useful against Lack of Villain. You you often need a bit of damage scaling in Act One for the boss, and Indignation is damage scaling that works with Rushdown. Hmm. Also, mm-hmm. Mental Fortress like it it works with your strongest cards yeah. in your card pool basically. Yeah, I've, I've come more and more to really appreciate the cards that are like do this thing or another thing. Cause... Yeah. It's a flexible tool. For sure. Okay. Yeah, yeah. How? I mean, this is a really big question. Maybe we'll leave that to the end and see if we have any energy. Do you have any cards that have dramatically changed in value for you over the last two years? Let's see, dramatically changed in value. I might have to say demon form, actually looking at my run history. Sure. <laughs> uh, I'm really impressed with uh, how that... It's it's so useless in, in most fights, but as a, a specifically anti-boss card, it's very hard to beat Demon Form on Ironclad. Mm-hmm. Let's see. Other card that I've really changed my opinion on. Demon like Form? Like I said, I, I'm valuing Backflip a lot more on Silence. Okay. I'm very happy with that. Yep. And on defect, I think Meteor Strike is the probably the standout that has really come to the forefront of my mind. I used to used to ignore it very often because it's like it's going to be too much of a pain in the butt to get this in play. And now I'm looking at it like if I can get this in play anyway, it's going to be worth it. So I'm starting to take it more and, and finding it very abusable. I've had some really cool runs where like working out how to beat Act 2 with Meteor Strike was how I won a defect run that was unwinnable in any other way. Yeah. You have one for Watcher? Card that I've changed my opinion on on Watcher. Hmm. Probably the Divinity cards I've actually come around on a lot sure. more. Even even Prey, actually. I've I've been taking prey a lot, and so I feel like I've got a better hand, handle on when you can and cannot take prey. Yeah. Um, you definitely need an abundance of card draw first because it's one of those tricky cards that doesn't do anything immediately. Watcher yeah. hates those cards. Yeah. With a passion, but um, it can be, it can be really nice. Two two prostrate pluses and a prey. I think is my favorite ten to ten mantra engine on that character. Sure. Three three four it works out perfectly. And a uh, prismatic shard for all for one. Prismatic shard for all for one. That's right. To get back the prostrates. I, I think I've done that one time. Prostrate all for one. That's that's fun. Easy game. Easy game. Easy game. Yeah, easy. Um, trying to think what mine are now because I asked you the question. But I think for me, weirdly, Dark Embrace is the card that has changed most in evaluation for me in Ironclad, which is weird because it was already like S tier and it's just gone to S plus plus yeah. plus plus tier. S- but... s- s- serpent face tier. Yeah. All the S's. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's kind of a weird answer. I think Blood for Blood as well um, as a card that can just be all of the damage in a duck. Um, yes. Definitely my biggest like floor one pick. On yeah, cloud changed, and I think I think I would say the same of Viscerate on Silent. I didn't used to realize For it was sure. like the best floor one pick. Yeah, it's not quite that, but it is. It's really really good. It's very high up there. Yeah, for Silent, like Sneaky Strike, Eviscerate, basically every card on Silent that gets better if you take Acrobatics earlier uh, has yeah. gone up in value for me. Yep. Um, but perhaps on Silent, the card that has changed the most in value is Wraith Form. Wraith Form. I, I was just thinking about Wraith Form as a card that's gone down in evaluation. Was there a Wraith Form in these 37 runs? I saw one in one of my silent runs. Oh, I have one. Wait, no, I'm going the wrong direction. I know I've seen one, myself deliberately skip. Two. Okay, many I have forms. some Wraith Forms. I have three. Yeah, I just like, I guess I don't note them anymore. 
Nightmare Wraith Farm is definitely a win condition. I had three in my silent runs. Um, but yeah, I just I do not take it as often. And the reason for that is that I do not think that it is necessary for winning the late game anymore. So if I'm taking it, it is largely because I think it's useful as like a tempo oriented card for act two. Yeah. Yeah. I usually find myself taking it when I've got when I have my damage sorted, but my block is just not mm -hmm. together whatsoever. But yep. if I've got a footwork and a well aid plans, I, I don't need a Wraith form. That's kind of how I'm looking at it these days. Yeah. And like it's definitely obviously still an incredibly strong card, but this is one of those situations where it's gone from S plus 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 to only S or A plus for me. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's still exceedingly breakable for sure. Yep. For defect, it's fission very easily. Fission used to be like a card where it was like, oh, that's really powerful. It would be lovely if I could play it, but it doesn't really fit my deck. It's gone from that to being like, well, fission is so strong that I have to build my deck so it will be good. Um, and I'm very frequently having two fissions in my deck, and I'm very frequently playing them on turn one. Yeah. And it feels strong, so I've been liking that. And for Watcher, I think it might be Lesson Learned. Because the fewer cards you're taking on Watcher, the less important it is to upgrade your cards. The last time I took Lesson Learned, it's because I hadn't found a damage card and I needed something that dealt 20 in Wrath, which is <laughs> very <laughs> funny to me. Um, you need to be able to break that wing statue. Yeah. Um, exactly. It's obviously, it's obviously still a strong card, but the issue I've had with it is that my Watcher losses are tending to come to getting attacked for 20 on turn 1 of Act 2, and lesson learned is a bit slow to really help with that, and I am not finding that I lose much other than that anymore. And when I do, it's not in ways that lesson learned really helps with. It's like to a really bad gremlin nub draw, or um, to not finding any cards that do what I need for a late game. So those are my answers. I, to, I guess to kind of to segue off of that. Um, a question you ask is, what is you, would you identify as the most likely causes of a loss yeah, for on sure. each character? And you named one of the big ones for Watcher, which is um, early, early Act 1 Elites going badly. And it can actually be any of the three, right? Lagavulin with if a bad draw order. If you don't get into Eruption, if you don't get into Wrath or Gremlin Knob, if you don't pair... Like, I feel like I've gotten to a point where I understand when Lagavulin can kill me and I just take 40 sometimes because Watcher is so strong that you can, if you recognize you might die, you should just take 40 instead, basically. Yep. yep. Um, so I don't think I've died to Lagavulin very much, but I have definitely taken lines in the Lagavulin fight where I might take 40. Um, and then Sentries, Sentries is quite difficult on watcher although i've found it taking more damage um very aggressively like taking two to three good damage cards is my priority on watcher and does yeah. really well for everything up until act two i've started to find some really aggressive lines that can help with sentries if your deck is struggling yeah like sometimes you've got bowling bash or whatever you can just kill them easy but yeah um in in situations where it's like you don't have what it takes in a prolonged fight against the sentries. Watcher fares very, very poorly because you basically can't enter wrath. Yeah. So sometimes you just enter wrath immediately and you take twenty from one of them, but you just kill the other two immediately. Yeah, that's very, and that actually very ends common up being the, for me. The easiest way to win. Yeah, definitely. When I think about Act One elite fights as Watcher, I think that I am in wrath. <laughs> like, yeah, I don't it's think Lagavulin attacks for twenty. I think Lagavulin attacks for forty. Um, when I'm playing Watcher against Lagavulin. And that isn't always the case, but I'm always thinking about worst case scenario as Watcher because that's sort of the only one you have to worry about. Yeah. And I think the other big loss case for Watcher is, uh, for me anyway, turn two, three against Heart. Uh -huh. Of course, Watcher has 67 max health, Heart attacks you for 67, you die if you don't get some kind of block engine going. Yep. And not every Watcher run is able to get the, like, talk to the hand, mental fortress, whatever yep. that you need. So that sometimes one, you just kind of fall flat there. That one is why I stopped building 
the sorts of decks that you're building on Watcher. Yes, I, I completely get it. And I, I've I've had a couple of Watcher runs that have been like real close to the edge yeah. against Heart for that reason. But there was always a feeling for me of like, if I built this sort of deck a bit better, I would have won. And I don't know. If I kept trying for like two or three years and got better at it, is that would would that have happened? I don't know. Because I traded I think, I think it can. I traded my losses to the heart for losses to like getting attacked for twenty one by shelled parasite. And it's <laughs> currently it feels like the right choice, but it sure isn't enjoyable to get attacked for turn <laughs> yeah. for twenty one by shelled parasite and just be like, parasite, Well, I man. built a deck that cannot do anything about this. Whoops. Through eruption in four strikes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Whoops. Oh dear. <laughs> um, yeah. Yes. Okay. So I guess I'll, I guess I'll go backwards in character rotation in this Defect. one. Defect. Most likely places to die. Act two. Uh, Gremlin knob deals me a lot of damage as defect very often. Yeah. And probably the worst elite matchup in Act one. Defect's area of effect damage is really good and also three cards. <laughs> so. Hard to find, but good. Yeah, it's great that Electrodynamics exists, and Doom and Gloom is such a good card, which is one of the cards that's gone up and up and up in evaluation for me over time. Um, and Sweeping Beam's fine, too. I'm happy to take a Sweeping be. Beam like in Act 1 or whatever. I'll even upgrade it You really it gotta sometimes. upgrade it. And yeah. Sweeping Beam, it's a card that's good with Hologram and Rebound. It Put definitely it is. Yeah. yeah, if I'm reliant on Sweeping Beam for my damage in Act 1 for AoE, I am much more likely to take Hologram, for sure. That that synergy is very present in my mind. Uh, but if you don't get like, those three, like, what do you, what do you do? <laughs> you fight against Gremlin Leader, and you're like, well, every two turns I can deal enough damage to kill the minions, and I sure hope Gremlin Leader never attacks me because if yeah. Gremlin Leader does, it will be for sixty-three. <laughs> sixty-three, yikes! And technically, Blizzard is an AOE damage card. Right? Oh, that's true. <laughs> I've I've had more runs where Blizzard's good once I've leaned more into Fission because it can actually just deal thirty oh, yeah, on I turn bet. one now with the types of decks I'm playing. It's pretty wild. Yeah, not, not many decks that can do that. Yeah, and it doesn't do that by the time that I get to Gremlin Leader for sure. But like it fairly regularly, like that is not unheard of output for my defect decks on a turn one of. Act three and four. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, so act act two multi enemy fights, the three cultists, the slavers, the grim leader can all be a big problem. Collector yeah. two, depending on the deck. Although collector I think defect fares a little bit better against because the if orbs you're using don't orbs, get frailed. Exactly. Yeah. Same with Lagavulin, exactly. Lagavulin, where like one of the reasons I feel okay about taking cool headed is how good it is against Lagavulin and sentries. It's obviously not great against Gremlin Up. But no, it is very good against Lago Villain and Sentries. So, so good. Very good is maybe like overstating it, but it's like it is clearly good enough against those two enemies to be justifying taking it for what it does later in my mind. Simply beautiful. Yeah. But then Gremlin Knob still exists. With Defect, yeah. I skip elites in Act 1 and 2 much, much, much more often than the other characters and feel like it's right to. Because I feel I like. Think Defects can really, really thrive on a small, heavily upgraded deck. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Your card pool wins you runs. Um, you don't need the relics anywhere near as much. Yeah, I think you said previously, defect more than the other characters can outscale the game yeah. with its card pool. Yeah. Like, I mean, watch your can as well. But... Orbs. Yeah. <laughs> definitely. <laughs> so very definitely. Yeah, the way that Defect does it feels different, though. It's like, you're not going infinite. You are just, the number that you make is bigger than everything else in the game. Every turn. Every single turn by pressing E, yeah. Yeah. Uh, silent, how about Silent? Silent. Slime Boss, of course. I think Ugh. it's one of the one of the big issues you for know, that character. I, I, slime Boss is tough for Silent. I did a grudge match against Silent. Against Slime Boss, though, a silent where I was like, I'm going to play 50 Act 1s with Slime Boss at the end and see how I do. And I stopped after going 9 and 1, where the only loss was to a mistaken elite fight, where I'd stopped preparing for the Slime Boss fight because I felt like I'd already won it. And I just was like, well, actually, if I prepare for this fight, I just win every time. So my takeaway was just like, 
I am not respecting the slime boss enough. And ever since I did that, I feel like I've been doing much, much, much better. Yeah, I, that, that makes sense. If you if you are keeping the exact capabilities of the slime boss in mind, yeah, and counterpicking appropriately, if and if your only goal is to get out of Act One, the question is, can you do that in a way that sets you up for Act Two and Act Three? This for me goes back to a thought that Electrobolt expressed to me like three or four years ago. Electrobolt, I think, is definitely one of the best silent players of all time. He focused very heavily on that character and played it very, very, very well, and. He was looking at a card reward screen in Act 1, and he was like comparing like a couple of cards he was choosing between. He was like, well, I guess it's important for me to ex admit that Act 2 exists. And I was like, whoa. Because <laughs> mm -hmm. like, he was thinking so heavily about how to get through Act 1 that he was not even bothering to consider Act 2 yet. Um, and obviously that's too extreme. Like That isn't how you actually should play, but... It's a tremendously powerful mindset to have sometimes, and I've definitely played some runs where I'm just like, I am going to just pretend only Act 1 exists. And I've played some runs where literally I beat Act 1 and end the game. So it's interesting to see how play changes when you do that. Definitely. I've, I've, I've seen many, many runs where all you needed to do was just get to the next boss reward screen in order to, right. to, to round the corner, so to speak. Like, yeah runs that have limped past champ using a weird potion combo and then just like suddenly it's easy because you've got pandora's box with an egg yep or pyramid or something and i've i've played the game long enough that i've like been fighting nemesis with a deck that cannot possibly win and then gotten corruption add dead branch from the card reward screen so you know corruption yeah. and dead branch from one floor is kind of good pretty pretty sweet pretty sweet or, um, I don't know where else? Silent dies because I think I've won my last. I think I've won nineteen out of my last twenty Silent runs. Wow! Like since I leaned more into acrobatics, I just don't really. I don't know. I have struggled to lose on this character of late. Impressive. Let's see where else do I struggle on the Silent? Not to the heart, that's for sure. I feel like Silent has the best heart matchup of just about anybody. Oh, she's yeah. Piercing Whale is so ludicrous against the heart. Malaise, well laid plans, leg sweep. High meter, corrupt heart, slime boss, slime boss, grab the knob, slime boss. Corrupt Lots of heart. slime bosses. High meter. I'm seeing a. Oh, I'm, all right. I'm seeing. I've seen four entries for time meter in the last like 10 runs. Of I've also. Specifically. I've also died to time meter recently. Time meter can be a bit tough for sure. I feel like Time Eater is the most difficult of the Act 3 bosses if you're playing on A20 because of the... Yeah, that, unless that you're playing a really move. weird um, deck that cares about Awaken 1's strength gain, but those are uncommon, I think. Yeah, those are pretty rare. I Weirdly, I've been talking all about how I've been card spamming and taking acros and going infinite on silent, but the deck that lost to Time Eater was the only one that I've had that didn't do that <laughs> lately. Like, I just had blade dance and accuracies and I didn't draw the blade dance fast enough when I was getting vulnerable and then attacked for a billion. And I died in the second half blade of the Blade dance decks are very challenging against time eater, I yeah. tended to find. Yeah. Uh, to the point where I, I, I usually stop myself at two blade dances because if I go further down that road, I end up critically weak to time eater or heart for beat of death. Yeah, I agree for sure. Like I, if I'm using Blade Dance as a damage source, I also like will take Deadly Poison Plus in Act Three sometimes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. One, it's surprising how much of a difference one Deadly Poison can make against Time Eater. Yep, for sure. And then when you get offered your Catalyst next floor, you're like, oh, <laughs> good game. Where are your Ironclad losses? Ironclad. I feel like Ironclad's kind of all over the place. I don't know that I have a common... That's also how I feel about yeah. Ironclad. Ironclad's so weird. Like, maybe to Hexaghost as a occasional death, but... Oh yeah, I'm, I'm seeing a few Hexaghosts here when I'm looking through my losses, but not, not a whole lot of repetition. I've been buying two Sentries and Gremlin Leaders recently. Sorry, Sentries and what? Sentries and Gremlin Leaders recently oh have, gremlin leader yeah i had two gremlin, gremlin leader, leader deaths back to back oof the, the win streak brutal 
I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if it was actually a win streak or if it was just I'm only sorting by losses. So yeah, Gr Grim Leader is one of those weird fights where even if you fail the deck check, you sometimes get to go on, kind of like Nemesis. Yeah, you just sometimes the enemy just gives it to you by using the wrong attack pattern. Right, and you can manipulate the attack pattern by killing the adds. So if you have enough single target to kill the adds, you're putting yourself in the zone where you're only 30% to ever actually get attacked by Gremlin Leader on the attack yeah. turns. Yep, yep. Yeah, usually the other place my Ironclad runs will die is late Act 3 when it just kind of is like the this pile of cards mm -hmm. that don't really synergize together when ironclad can't really create anything cohesive yeah and then kind of transient just like kills it. you yeah I've, i definitely have ironclad runs where i'm like i am in act three i am drawing five cards a turn three of them are my starter cards and transients attacking me for 80 like <laughs> <laughs> yeah this deck didn't happen i guess to strike defend Ascender's Bane in demon form hooray <laughs> <laughs> oh my god i i drew I drew Demon Form, Demon Form, Demon Form, Corruption Ascenders Bane on floor one of Act Two, uh, not that long ago. I clicked Pandora's box, and then the next, the next turn of combat that I had was that. <laughs> uh, Pandora's box is so fun sometimes. Yeah, the thieves well. attacked me for twenty-two. I, <laughs> you know, you know how it goes. Yeah. All right, cool. Would you like to talk about uh, avoiding burnout tonight, or is perhaps a three-hour video recording in your evening uh, already a cause of burnout? You know, let, let's let's touch on that real quick for our okay. evening, I guess. Sure. I think that'll that'll be good. So, burnout. How do you avoid burnout while streaming? You and I both have streamed Slate the Spire for many thousands of hours. Mm -hmm. Yet, we continue to choose to return to the game, and sometimes we even have fun. So the, the I almost is, always have fun. How do you can how do you ensure that you continue to have fun? How do you avoid raging or being bored by or feeling discouraged by yeah. the spire? Um for me the the game itself doesn't bore me in any way or burn me out in any way. Um for me I have always loved strategy games. And I've always loved talking about strategy games. For me, I started loving strategy games when I was like three, and I started loving talking about them when I was like eight. So, and those have been constants throughout my life ever since. In fact, a lot of the ways that I relate to other things in my life are based on those passions uh, as a starting point. So like the way I think about relationships is informed by strategy gaming. The way I think about like hmm. having other hobbies is informed by my love of strategy gaming. Um, so for me, I have always loved playing strategy games. I've always loved talking about strategy games. And Slay the Spire is just the best episodic viewer experience strategy game in the world, I think. And I have never, while playing it, thought, gee, I'm bored of playing this game. I'd like to play a different strategy game. I just... I spent a while playing Monster Train. It was great, but it's not like I was bored of Spire. It's just Monster Train was really good. Um, but anytime I'm playing Slay the Spire, I'm like in flow state, doing the thing I love most in the world, talking to a bunch of people about it in a way that I enjoy. And that just doesn't, for me, that doesn't get old ever. Um, what does burn me out with Slay the Spire is like, the stuff that is the streamer career part of it the like yeah. being a public figure having people talk about you having people decide that they know who you are and give you unsolicited advice or tell you things about yourself that they've decided because when you're a streamer you put all of yourself into your content and then other people decide what it means and they tell you what it means and it's very hard to keep who you are central in your brain when yeah, you how do you how do you separate yourself from other people's perceptions of you yeah and then especially when that's being live fed to you you get feedback on what people like and do not like um in strategy gaming i think being somewhat egotistical is very important it is hubristic to go against one of the most complicated strategy games in the world 
and say, I can work out how to beat you. Um, and so for me, like confidently saying, like, I think this strategy is right is central to my ability to pursue this game. It's not how I like treat my friends or other people or stuff like that. I'm not an asshole to human beings in general. But when I'm talking about a strategy game, yeah, I'm going to be sort of a jerk to it. I don't have to respect your, like, guardian boss fight. Like, no, absolutely not. That's yeah, not I what will, I'm here for. I will bully the champ with 100 metallicize. Exactly. <laughs> but because of the streamer element of it, for me to feel confident and strong about an opinion about Slay the Spire becomes frictus for other people where they see... Like, Baylor Lord likes to build a big Watcher deck and you don't. What's going on? Do you think he sucks? And it's like, that has... It's not the size of the deck that matters. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and my desire to feel strongly about strategies and Slay the Spire has no real interfacing with Baylor Lord in any way, right? It's just not what's going on. So for me, that's the struggle, is working out how to uh, navigate all of that. And I've had real issues with, like, I... I um, banned backseating on my channel because I was having anxiety attacks from the way that people were backseating, both the quantity of it and the like pitting me against other people that was going on and the, mm. the back talking when I tried to explain my strategy and people didn't understand that I was confident about a strategy because I'm a strategy gamer and I'm trying to win at a strategy game not because I think other people suck or something um, sometimes people get those confused um, so I, I did that. I have the auspicious title, I think, of having banned more Slay the Spire viewers than anybody else in the world. <laughs> so, more jetters. Yeah. Building well, a... You're the world champion ban. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> um, yeah, but building a channel which is full of people who, like, will respect me and understand the traits that I have and value them instead of, like, pushing back and saying, like you are boring play faster where it's like but this is part of me for me to deny the fact that i want to logically analyze a turn right now takes away part of me and you're asking me to do that day in and day out every day of my life for like a six hour live stream for years on end i don't want to give up what's part of me like if you don't like me go watch someone else you know mm -hmm. so Getting my ego to the appropriate size, I think, has been very important for avoiding that sort of burnout where I started with an ego that was like uh, Play-Doh, where like if somebody punched my ego, it would just like flatten and I'd feel fucking awful. And there have been times in my streaming career where things have been going really well for me and my ego will start to like get a bit better. Like, oh, I'm like pretty good at this streaming thing. I'm, I'm pretty good at playing Slay the Spire, stuff like that. And... I found that when my ego expands too much, people like poke at it and I it hurts me for for people to attack the things that I'm like proud of and celebratory of and stuff. And so I have an ego that is very like compact and structurally sound. I I mention my achievements every like two or three months and someone's like, Oh, I can't believe you're gloating about yourself. And I'm like, I really don't do that. I have achievements and I talk about them a very appropriate amount of the time, and I'm confident, and I trust that I'm doing this okay. Um, I worked out how to take advice from people I trust and ignore unsolicited criticism from people I don't trust, and I worked out that I'm not, like, the smartest person in the world or anything. I'll never be the best strategy gamer in the world. There are tons of people who are awesome. Honestly, a lot of the world's most valuable people are not streaming Slay the Spire on Twitch, like they're doing other Last things, me. you know? What do you mean? So I'm an entertainer and being an entertainer is important, but I think I do a decent job of understanding that it has a level of importance and that I'm not the center of the world. Um, yeah, and for me that has generally worked. And these are both conceptual things. There's physical stuff like you have to go outside regularly. You have to take days off. This is yes, you have to take days off. Vacation has been a a, a big one for me. Yeah. I know. So interesting when you talk about avoiding burnout, you're mostly discussing the the st 
streaming aspect of it, the interacting with a huge crowd. Yeah. Well, there's also, public... I discussed the mental element of it. There's a physical element of it, which is like, if you imagine you're a house plant, you basically get all the way there. So I think that's pretty simple. Like, get sunlight, get good food and water, uh, get good yeah. rest. It, it, basic office ergonomics are a pretty important thing. Yep. Um, especially in, in this career. So I used to have this big cozy chair mm -hmm. that I used on the stream. I was sitting in it last time we did a, a collab video. Yeah, I remember that. Um, and that was, a, that was a big sort of core piece of the stream for a long time. But what I didn't really talk to people about was that I was in the big recliner in the first place because I had sat in an office chair so much that it had become painful just to yeah. sit in a normal chair. And I, could, it, I had pushed my body to the point where I could no longer comfortably sit in a normal chair. Mm -hmm. So I had to make a change to something. I, I did a big recliner, and that worked out really well for a long time. But I was in there because my body was injured. Yep. And... Over the years of streaming, I've had to make a lot of adjustments to my ergonomics, um, the way that I hold my mouse, um, the amount of hours I that a, I play per day. I have day. a vertical mouse. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I've got one of these. Yep. Yeah, we have Very the same one. Here. Yep. Yeah. Yep, yep. <laughs> because I quite a bit. started having RSI. <laughs> yep. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. This job can become exactly. physically painful. It bec becomes mentally painful. I have had therapy. I have had a physical therapist as well. Yeah. 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 So yeah, you spoke absolutely to the the sort of mental and physical aspects of the the social engagement. I agree with those a hundred percent. Very similar journey. Um, you don't seem to have any trouble in terms of like engaging with Slay the Spire itself and, and keeping that interesting. No, not for me. In fact, people ask me to play mods for Slay the Spire, and for me it's just like but I want to play Slay the Spire. <laughs> yeah, you're so. like, I, I'm really happy just doing A20 runs. Exactly. And I get it. It totally yeah. makes sense. For me, I do feel like I need to vary my play a little bit to stay interested. This is um, part of why I'm personally married to the rotating character format. I yeah. change characters every oh, run. Because... That is necessary for my yeah. sanity. I yeah, exactly. exactly. It's necessary for my At this point, too. I couldn't do other than that. When I started out, sure, but at this point, no. No, no, I have to, I have to keep changing characters because I don't know, it feels too samey otherwise. And, and likewise, I, I don't let myself pick the same cards in the same way yeah. too many times in a row. So I'll, I'll start picking like after 20 watcher runs in a row, I'm just gonna be like, it's pressure points time. Every run, let's go. Yeah. yeah I'm just for sheer variety. I'm in this weird place where I like. I kind of want to hold 80% rotating win rate for 100 runs, and I'm fairly close to doing it, and I probably... I, I think I'm more than 50% to pull it off, probably, if I go for it from here. I'm ahead of pace right now. Um, I'm ahead of pace 71 runs in. So that's 29 that's more. Good. That's pretty good. Yeah. Um, that's not that bad. But I am getting so bored of taking the choices that I think are right <laughs> yeah. when I when I like I'm so ready to just play 240 hours in a month and just do random stuff again because yeah 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 definitely and so it's something that I do to avoid burnout um, with the game mechanics itself is occasionally kind of put self-imposed rules upon myself mm -hmm. um a long time ago, I did this with the Ladder Street Challenge, where the goal was to beat all the ascensions consecutively. This was back before getting longer win streaks on E20 yeah. was something people were managing to do. I started a YouTube um, series largely inspired by your challenge, where I'm. Oh. I just did a new account, and I'm just playing Ascension Zero up to Ascension Twenty, which I've never done yeah. before, because I like Ascension Fifteen was out for a year or something can, before Ascension you Twenty. You can make was, a thousand yeah. cuts work when you're doing that. I, I do it at Ascension 20, Baylor. And, <laughs> and I, have, I have encouraged you to do it as well. Live your, I, I will. Live your I, dream, Baylor. I will Baylor. take the next Act 1000 cuts that I yes. see based on this conversation. Yes. I'll do it. This makes me happy. Yes. Excellent. Excellent. Um, and so uh, once I felt like I'd mastered the, the ladder challenge, I started doing it with additional caveats. Uh-huh. Uh, I did... No skip ladder challenge. That was one of the most fun things that I've done. 
that culminated in a 50 card a20 <laughs> silent victory <laughs> do you have to pick up prayer wheel if you're offered it y yes oh yes. Let's, let's go yes. yeah that was that one was fun as a challenge format because I found myself taking lots of events to avoid the card rewards that were so sure, bad. Sure, yeah, so yeah. Hallway was, fights are fun. actively bad for you. That's funny. <laughs> yeah, and then I did max twenty cards with the letter format, and I've done similar things. I've also made variations to my A twenty play, like boss swap only, or uh, now my goal is to do forty five minutes average runtime or less. Sure. That's what I'm trying to do right now on stream. And that's been that's been fun. It's been exhausting, actually, but do very you, fun. Something that I've always been irritated by about that is you have to build your deck differently, right? It's not just playing faster. It's also you like actually have to build a different sort of deck because some decks take too long to collect the cards. Some decks take way too long. Yeah. Like acrobatics, spam, any kind of clicky infinite can really slow you down. Yeah. Um, the the silent run I played where I played 440 cards on turn one of the heart fight would not have been a great deck for right. <laughs> beating the game in under 45 minutes. No. No, yeah. So that yeah, and that that has led to stuff like I'll take I just took a catalyst on floor 1 cuz sure. I don't care if it doesn't well, work out, and if it works I mean, out, it was great. <laughs> if you lose, does that lower your average? <laughs> if, you, if, if you die on floor six? That was no. a five-minute run, right? Yeah. <laughs> pretty, pretty good. That's yeah. When I do funny. my like um, winning 100 times in 30 days sorts of things, that's never about maximizing the number of times I win in 30 days, really. right? It's like, this is a different way to play where my goal is slightly different. And I'll usually come in like playing one and a half to two hour runs because that's where I'm most comfortable, I'd say. And then over the course of a couple of weeks, I'll be like dialing it in to a point where I'm playing 50 to 60 minute runs. But I don't go to the point where I'm building my decks differently. Like if the run tells me I should build a deck that takes a long time to play, I'm going to do that even though I'm setting those yeah. challenge conditions for me. I don't really you... like the the time element making my card choices change. That's not something i'm a fan of yeah and you never decide to do anything like um okay i'm I'm at the start of act two with a really crap deck i'm just gonna abandon run because it's faster no i that. i try to win all the runs yeah yeah that's for the most part what i've been doing uh, i've been in one or two runs but i'm just trying to like win fast with the winning be more important than the fast currently i'll see if i can continue <laughs> to feel that way I can't quite go as fast as I want to for long periods of time because, again, the RSI is an issue. Right, sadly. Oh, for sure. Brutal. Do you um, do you find that you store stress physically while you're streaming? Like your shoulders get hunched and your feet get curled and stuff like that? Yeah, uh, yeah. My my back. Yeah. Like tension. Yeah. After I get off stream, I have to like twist mm -hmm. with yoga. Yeah. For like ten minutes, and I can just feel it slowly bleeding out of me. Yeah. All I'm... that tension. I have shoulder blades. Mandatory full credits watch after every heart kill, because that is the way that I have discovered to force myself to stand up and walk around and things, which is just so necessary for full, my health. Full what? Full credits watch. Full credits watch. Gotcha. We yeah. always watch the entire credits of the game after every heart kill on my channel. Well, I don't because I'm walking around, but my viewers have to. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's that's good. Yeah. I've I've adopted a habit of of you know a five to ten minute break after every run, generally speaking. Yep. Um, breaks are a weird thing on Twitch, as uh, they I, very I know much you're, are. You're well aware. Yeah. You, like bleed money for every second that you're not on the camera, but at the yep. same time you need to take the breaks for your human self. So it's like yeah, but it's like the jawworm fight. You have to take four damage. To, yeah. You know. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I'm going to use me, the jawworm the, fight as a metaphor for most things in my life from now on. The, the, jawworm is the journey of life, yeah. really. Like, I'm going to be on a first so, date. I'm going to be like, well, my friend Baylor Lord once took 47 damage to jawworm on floor one. And I learned a lot from that. Right, um, yeah. Like, if, if that can happen to me, is your life really so bad? Yeah. No. If you want no. the pasta, I say go for it. Like That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Yeah. <laughs> All right.
Well, it has been <laughs> it has been really awesome to talk to you. This has been a very fun conversation. I think this, we this covered, has been a, a very enjoyable three hours. Yeah, I think we covered a billion things that are very interesting about this game and streaming and mental health and physical health more generally. So yeah, uh, yeah. Again, this is Baylor Lord, who's on Twitch.tv slash Baylor Lord, and links below. And I'm Jorbs. And I'm this is Jorbs. Yeah, he's on YouTube and Twitch, a very, very talented Spire Slayer. Also dang good at Celeste, I might say. Um, and just a, a very, very cool dude to, to talk to and listen to a lot. So if you've not heard of the one and only Jorbs, please check him out. Yeah, and, and Baylor is also on you, YouTube. Jorbs, for our conversation today. Of course. I'm sure I'll talk to you again sometime soon. And... Uh... I hope everyone's enjoyed the the thing. All right. Yeah. I'm gonna All hit, right. well, this hit is, go. This is Baylor signing off. Bye-bye. Everybody. Thanks for watching this absurdly long video. <laughs>